Okay, today it's our privilege to have Rock and Roll Express Ricky Morton with us. He's been everywhere and done just about everything, and he's going to share it with you all today. Let's start off with how did you get your start in the business? Well, first of all, well, before I even start off about how I got in this business, I want people to understand that I am Ricky Morton of the Rock and Roll Express, and this interview that you're going to see is me. I'm not trying to be anybody else. I'm just Ricky Morton. So some things I say that might hurt somebody's feelings, I'm sorry, but this is the truth, and I'm going to let it be the truth, okay? Well, the way I got started in business, my dad was a professional wrestler. Uh, matter of fact, my dad, uh, to start off with that, my dad, you know, he was a police officer, then he went to the Marine Corps, was a drill instructor in the Marine Corps, then he got into wrestling. My dad wrestled and refereed. His career lasted for like 40 years. And I got to say over those years, which is, I feel like that I was one of the lucky ones, but it was a hard life. You got to understand, my dad, back in the wrestling years, then my dad pulled the ring, he refereed, and, and that's, with me and my four brothers, we had to go with my dad to help him. So I'm trying to tell you, at, at the age of about eight years old, you know, we were going to towns every night, getting into wrestling. See, I was always in the wrestling business. You know, by the time I got 16 years old, I really didn't want nothing to do with wrestling because I've been around it all my life. I set wrestling rings up and I did this, but my dad was still in the business. Matter of fact, he was working, you know, my dad worked for everybody, you know, for uh, Nick Lewis, the, the, I'm all tongue-tied trying to play. Uh, you know, he worked for the Crockett's, Jerry Jared, you know, uh, down in Florida for the Grams. You know, he did all this right here, always on the road and always gone. And that's something I didn't really want to put into my life. But as the years went on, like, you know, when I got out of high school, I started a job working every day, you know, like everybody does, 7 to 3.30 in the afternoon, same job every day, every day. And then I went to my dad one night with a wrestling match. As a matter of fact, it was in Evansville, Indiana. And, and as being a kid, I always learned, you know, because I don't, I don't learn how to work. I didn't have a match when I was 14 years old. You know, I was a guy named uh, Ricky Fields out of Mobile, Alabama, which is dead on the Pensacola territory, the, the Field Brothers. Uh, he was there some, I mean, he was like the same age. So, uh, you know, we go to the towns together. My dad put the ring up, and Ricky traveled with us a lot, and so we'd have matches. Well, hell, you know, if I was 16 years old, my brother would tear the house down. You know, he'd be babyface or I could be healed because, see, we was brought up in this business. We knew what we were doing. So uh, I went to, uh, uh, while I was working my job, it went on strike. And being on strike, I didn't have no job to do. So I, uh, I went out of town with my dad one night, and one of the wrestlers didn't show up. And it, you know, like I said, being in the business all my life, I always took my gear with me. I don't know why, just to have it. Did, didn't think about wrestling, wasn't going to wrestle, but I just, my dad always did that too. So I got to tell him somebody didn't show up, I had a match. Mm -hmm. Well, Nick Gould seen this, and he looked at me and said, son, how long have you been working this? Said, well, you know, I was just about, really one of my first live matches I ever had. He said, man, I can't believe it. I said, damn, you're just as good as the guys I got here. You know, it would be interested in wrestling. You know, so I thought about it for a while, you know, you get out there and you get that glory and people hollering around you sign autographs and all these little pretty girls running around here. I'm 18 years old. <laughs> what else do you think I want to do? I'm going to be a wrestler, right? So uh, that's that's really how I started out, like, like my first match right there. Matter of fact, my first match was with a guy named Tojo Yelamoto. Uh He's one of the old-time favorite wrestlers, one of the best wrestlers in the world with his psychology in the ring because people can understand about these days, how to get heat in the match. All this guy here had to do was just like reach down like he's going to his tights. Damn, the crowd would go crazy. Man, they thought he was going to kill you. So that was one of my first matches with him. Not only did he make me look good, but what I was knowing, I knew what to look good because he knew how to get his heat, you know, talking to me the whole time, you know, when to make you come back, when to throw a punch. So I was very lucky at that moment, too, because them days when you work with people that in a match, brother, they could work. It ain't like it is these days, like when. You meet somebody and say, uh, well, how long have you been working? And they're on the independent circuit. Well, five years. Well, out of that five years, well, they had 20 matches. But they've been working for five years. They don't know shit. You know what I'm saying? They think they know everything, but don't know shit. So I was lucky back in those days because everybody you work with could work. If you couldn't work, you would, you'd have a job. Right. You know, brother, they gave you notice you were gone. So that's really basically how I got started in the business. From there, I started working for a promoter named Nick Goulas out of Nashville, Tennessee, with his son, George Goulas. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, that's where I really first started. So he gave you your first break? Well, no, he didn't give me my first break. He started me in the business. Started in business. Business was different then. Yeah. yeah. No, you got the shit beat out of you every night. 
But, you know, you still got to understand, I'm 18 years old, you're in the limelight, you're on TV every Saturday. Because mm -hmm. back then, you know, you did t your TV come on every Saturday. You know, all your buddies in high school were seeing you on TV every Saturday. No matter if you was getting beat. But back then, the business meant something. You know, it, you, you followed a pattern. You know, uh, maybe he might give you a little win here. But, you know, you, you were making money. For, the guys were beating you that were on top mm -hmm. to draw money with the guys on top. You know, that's where I first started. I stayed there for about six months, I imagine. Yeah, did all your friends know it was a work at that time, or was it still pretty much getting... Buddy, in them days, you, you you had the people that says, well, some of it's fake. Yeah. But did you see that last match when Lynn Rossi and Tojo Yellowmoto was wrestling? That was real. Yeah. You see, there's always that little edge back then. Uh -huh. Nobody knew for sure. Yeah. And plus, everybody back then, you can't fade. Yeah. You know? So where did you go after you you had with the run with Goulas? Well, okay, well, I had my run with Goulas. And, uh, and that's another time. See, at the time, my dad was working for Jerry Jarrett. Mm -hmm. See, Nick Goulas was based out of Nashville, mm -hmm. Tennessee, and Jerry Jarrett was based out of Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Like, they don't have that little territory. Uh, like, Nick Goulas is like Nashville, up to Bowling Green, Kentucky, down to Birmingham, Alabama, and Jerry Jarrett's like Memphis, Louisville, Kentucky, Evansville, Indiana, down in Mississippi and Arkansas, so and say that again. I'm off on a Wednesday night, and my dad says, "Won't you ride up to Evansville midnight? Take your bag, which you always do, you know." Right. So uh, and at that time, Jerry Jarrett, Memphis, Tennessee, was the hottest territory that anybody could ever imagine. What time period was this? Uh, this is about 1970. Seven, so right around this area, 77, 78. It was the hottest territory. You know, Jerry Lawler was brother. That's where you got the name King. Brother, yeah. This guy was over ungodly. You know, you can't believe it. You know, like Hulk Hogan or Steve Austin is these days, back in them days, but on your own territory. Uh, so uh, I rode up to uh, Evansville, Indiana. My dad, in which Jerry Jarrett was there, he was a promoter. And back then, you know, the motors went to all the shows. My brother saw that. You know, when I got there, I've been working for Nick Goulas. You know, where you have decent little houses. But the big thing then was working for Nick, going to Jerry Jarrett. That's like he's now being independent, going to WCW. Yeah. You see, Jerry Jarrett was the big territory. So, you know, I couldn't wait to go. You know, there was Jerry Lawler, you know, and all these Tojo Yalamoto, uh, Jackie Fargo, all the big name guys back then. So, uh, I rode up to Evansville, Indiana, and somehow again, somebody didn't show up. I know Jerry Jerry looked at me and Ricky, I know you work for Nick, but uh, if you like to work, he said, I, you know, I'll give you $100 if you want, you know, $100, but hell, I'm going to make $100 a week for Nick Goose. Yeah. You'll give me $100 for a match. And plus, the place was sold out. At another time, I'm lucky again, because the night I had an opportunity to work with Ken Wayne. You guys ever heard of Ken Wayne? Mm -hmm. Ken Wayne's a wrestler in Memphis, his daddy is the buddy Wayne Peel. And I gotta say, Ken Wayne, brother, what a hell of a worker he was, man. A good God. This guy, say because back then, you had to be good if you didn't have a job. And Ken Wayne was working for Jerry Jerry, so he had to be good. Mm -hmm. but you know me and Ken's about the same age. So, uh, I said, sure. So he said, I'll tell you what you do, y'all just go, uh, go out and go Broadway. Time of it, match. Well, man, Ken Wayne was such a great worker, brother. And, uh, Ken, you know, both of us being young, boy, we full of that piss and vinegar. And we go out there, brother, we tear the damn house down. I couldn't believe it, you know, because all the time I've been getting, you know, for Nick Gillis, you know, you're putting guys over, blah, 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 you're in the middle, but people standing up, they're screaming, they're goddamn hollering. We're making, our, we're making my comeback on it, brother, selling like a son of a bitch, boom, 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 you go into the false finishes. Boy, if I got to beat one, two, the bell rings. You know, and it's time limit. You know, I gotta say, what Ken Wayne, but he's a hell of a worker. I know, uh, we're going that later with him and Danny Davis. What a great tag team, which tag teams were like that today. But I came back and we walked through the door, man, Ken, you know, because the Evansville, it's an old more real building. The hills come this way, and we come down the steps, and then Ken Wayne met in the middle. And I really didn't know Ken at, at, well at that time, but you know, I knew who he was. But we grabbed each other and hugged and said, man, thank you. And he said, thank you. Hell, well, we had a hell of a match. But but uh, walks Jerry Jarrett. Ken Wayne, what a hell of a match you just had. Ricky Morton, uh, I heard a lot about you, you know, through your dad, because he referees here. He says, you have a job here if you want it. 
uh, you just proved to me that you you know you were able to be here in this territory. Uh, he said, "I know you worked for Nick Gillis back then. It was you know it's more uh, you know because you, you you gave you notice. It was just respect. You see what I'm saying? <coughs> so I went back to Nick Gillis and gave a two week notice, and two weeks later I started in Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah. So the yeah. promoters were probably you know they got along a little better back then. See, they respected well, each other. Well, they territories. did, but you know Nick and Jerry, you know. It used to be all mixed yeah. territory, and Jerry, Jerry took it away. Yeah. But, you know, still, it wasn't the part of that. I just walk up and say, fuck you, Nick. Right. I'm going to Jerry, Jerry. You know, Jerry, Jerry understood that. Look, you'll give you notice to Nick, and uh, you can start here in Memphis, Tennessee, the following Saturday. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. Yeah. Sure did. He's a young little baby face full of piss and vinegar. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> so you started with Jarrett. Yeah, well, I started with Jerry, Jerry, and, uh, Matter of fact, and this is a great thing too, my first day on Memphis TV, guess who my partner was? Hmm. Superstar Bill Dundee. And that was great, you know, because Bill was a great, you know, and I, no, I wasn't looking there to go because, you know, this is the times that you, you got to understand it's a business, you know. I, you know, I wasn't going, hey, I'm going to be main event. But I couldn't believe my first day was Bill Superstar Dundee. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember who we worked with. But it might have been Ken Wayne and Dan Davis at the time. I don't know, but I know we had one hell of a match. But you know, Bill Dundee was you know, he was he was a superstar then, him and Jerry Lawler, you know. But you know, I was just lucky to be in a tag yeah. match with him and uh, I gotta appreciate that, you know, say and, and thanks to the guys back then. But see, because in a territory like that you gotta understand you had such great workers and if you had ability the boys would help you. If they knew that you wanted to say happy, you know, it's people like Jerry Lawler. And I don't give a damn what anybody says about anybody. You know, they say, well, they come to me and say, well, I don't like this guy, so they expect me not to like him. You understand? I treat people the way they treat me. And all these guys were all super nice to me, so I ain't got nothing bad to say about them. And if I did, I would tell you. But, you know, you got guys like Bill Dundee, Jerry Lawler, Dutch Mantel, that were here in this territory. But let me tell you, these guys were over. Oh, over, big time. You know, at the time it was Wayne Ferris, Larry Lathan, they call themselves the Black, the Blind Bombers. Mm -hmm. Danny Davis managed them. These guys here, they helped you. You know what I'm saying? Now, if you did something wrong, they corrected your ass right then. It wasn't just like, you know, you know like you did something wrong, Bill Dundee. You know, he did this right here. Bill always spit in the cup, you know. Here, you know, you got his butt. Ricky, come here, Don. You know, they didn't take you in front of all the boys. Hey, you stupid son of a bitch! I'm blah 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 blah. You know, and make you feel bad like Bill. Ricky Ray talked to take me to the room. Uh -huh. Oh, then he browbeat the shit out of me. You see what I'm saying? Right. But it made me learn. Mm -hmm. And my dad did the same thing. See, my dad told me when I first worked in this business, my dad was a great worker too. Mm -hmm. He says, son, I could sit here and talk to you till I'm blue in the face. To make you understand what I'm trying to tell you about this business, I'd be better off talking that damn wall. You're gonna have to learn it on your own. So you gotta understand what my, so my dad referee, you know, and he'd tell me things I did wrong. But the big guys like them, you know, they can't call you in the back room. They browbeat the shit out of you. Yeah. But when you open the door back up, it wasn't embarrassing for a lot of boys. You, know, but you did things right. You know, that's, uh, that's the way the business is different now. You know, nowadays you got these, you know, guys got, you stupid son of a bed. It wasn't like that then. Our business was a business, it was a sacred business, and everybody took care of it. So it's like the whole locker room was a bunch of mentors. Unlike today, where you're lucky to find one or two guys. Ah, brother. It's so, the business has changed so much in the last 10 years, it's unreal. You know, it's, uh, it's having respect for people, you know, and, but you don't see, in those days, even on up to the days that we were, were with the Crockett's where you don't see the boys depended on each other. Uh, it was us that had to depend on drawing the money. Like if your top baby face was here and your top heel was here, the underneath people had to put them over on the babyface side and the heel side for them to meet to sell out, to draw money for the people. Because you got paid by how many asses you put in the seat. You didn't have a contract. Yeah. So, you know, just think, just, what's the difference is, all right, you got to depend on how much money people you draw not to make a living. So you work three times as hard. So nowadays, hell, you get a million dollars, no matter what. You think he gives a fuck? You think he gives a fuck who he's going to work with tonight? Or gives a fuck what's going to happen next week? Hell, you get that check coming in every week. It don't matter. See, that's the difference between now and then. Right.
So you so you stayed with uh, that territory in Memphis. What was I that stayed schedule? there with them. I beg your pardon. What was the schedule like? You had a TV taping and then oh yeah, well it? it's uh, every, well I start off. You, you run TV every Saturday morning. It's live Memphis, Tennessee. But what you well, I don't know if you know what what I mean by a bicycle tape. You did your tape in Memphis Monday live. Well, the following next Saturday, it sh that tape showed in Louisville, in Evansville. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The, way, the tapes were a week behind. <coughs> you started off live in Memphis. They taped it. And they sent that one to Louisville and to Evansville. You know, the, and the rest surrounding territories. Like, see what I'm saying? It's a bicycle tape. Yeah. That's what you mean by that. It goes around. Right. So, but you started out in Memphis. And uh, and back then we ran Jonesboro, Arkansas. At the, at the first, uh, Nick Gulas had Nashville. So he ran Jonesboro or Spot Show every Saturday night. Once a month, we ran Jackson, Tennessee on a Sunday. But Memphis was every Monday night. Mm -hmm. Louisville was every Tuesday night. Evansville every Wednesday. Uh, once a month on a Thursday, we run Lexington, Rupp Arena, Lexington, Kentucky. Big show. That was a big house show. Once a month. And then you had a spot show the other days. Every Friday was Tupelo, Mississippi, or a spot show. Then you start back again on Saturday morning at the tapings. Yeah. And then until. Nick finally closed down, then we ran Jonesboro Saturday night and Nashville Saturday night, you see. Mm -hmm. So, and that, and that's the way, it, that was your schedule. So that's how come you came here, because you worked every day. Yeah. So you went to a territory, you didn't have 50 guys. Remember you had 14 to 15 guys that worked the whole territory. You know, that's all the guys you had in the territory. And that, that's, that's the way that went. Right. You know? And you used to run this basically the same program every town? And well, it's a week behind until it, yeah, until it so. ran out, you know, and then, you know, up and coming. I mean, I remember uh, when I was there, you know, I got my first little break uh, there with a guy named, well, named Sonny King. I don't know if you know, it's like me and Steve Regal. guy, not the Steve Regal that y'all know off of uh, WCW, but another Steve Regal out of Indianapolis. Uh, we, uh, we used to hang together. We was young baby faces there. You know, we did our little matches where they put the baby faces over, or your little angles for your little spot show things. But my first break ever came was at a time, and I got a, my I had more respect for this guy than anybody in the world. It was a man by the name of Sonny King. Uh, Sonny King. You, you, you couldn't imagine it, how intimidating this fucker was, man. But Sonny, I love you, man. Sonny, about six foot eight, black man, bald hair, wore a big cowboy hat and cowboy boots, and sucked. On a Tootsie Roll Pop. That was Sonny King. And would knock you out before God got the word. He was tough. You know, Sonny was an uh, ex professional boxer. You know, he boxed Sonny Lipscomb back in his days and everything. But he had respect for this man. And one thing about Sonny, Sonny respected our business. And Sonny loved our business. And I don't care who you were, if you didn't, you wouldn't around Sonny King. Now, you had to understand this. I said, I got my first break with Sonny King. Him and my dad were good friends too. But, see, Sonny was kind of guy, double day, night, like you're the first guy. Say that you were working a show tonight. You're a young guy, green. You walk in the dressing room. No, you didn't walk in the dressing room. Sonny, look at you. Uh, your dressing room is down the hall down there. That's the man, public bathroom, where the people, the spectators are dressing. You wouldn't lie in the dressing room. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't. You, you hadn't earned, earned the respect to be in there yet. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, you couldn't, you couldn't come in there. That's the way Sonny was. And brother, you talking about K. Fabian? He, and Sonny, he beat your ass. He catch you talking to a baby face, or I mean, if I was baby face talking to a heel, you talking about brow beating, brother? Huh? But, but see, that's the respect you got on this business. This is the way he made his living. It's the way I made my living. It's the way everybody made their living, brother. And you respected it. If you didn't, you took ass whooping. And I mean big time. It's different ways of whooping ass back then. It wasn't what, in, the, in the dressing room. Let me have a match with this guy. Hmm. You go out to the ring, brother, you know, next thing you know, Sonny King don't beat your ass. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. In a respectable working way. <laughs> where, where you're saying, for now on, it's Mr. King. It's not Sonny, it's Mr. King. That's the way things were back then. Uh, I can say for instance, there was, um, there was this young guy. I've got to tell this story here. It's great. Dallas Montgomery. Young guy broke in. He come in one night in the dressing room and he had a gig mark on his head. So the king goes, What's that gig mark on your head? He says, Oh, I went home last night practicing the mirror, getting juice. 
my God, I turned around and looked and horns grew out of Sonny King's head. I went, oh shit. <laughs> right, I went, oh. He grabbed that bullet and said, let me tell you something, you stupid ass. When we get color that ring, that's to make money. This is the way we make our money. Well, you think it's some kind of gun damn joke? <laughs> bye, 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 bye. You know, i never seen Dallas Montgomery again. <laughs> but you see, yeah. you had to understand the respect of this business. But then, they teamed me up with Sonny King, and it, it was something bad for other people, but it was a time for me to learn. At this time, Jerry Lawler broke his leg playing f uh, football, backyard football, and uh, Bill Dundee called hepatitis. So Lawler was out, Dundee was out, so they put, and he, you know, Sonny King was a big heel there, so he turned Sonny babyface. And you gotta understand the population in Memphis is a lot of black people, so Sonny King was instantly over. Right. You see what I'm saying? Instantly over, boom. So, you know, Sonny got to talk to Jerry Jerry. He says, man, you know, I need, you know, I need me a, a white meat, fresh, young baby face. So I was lucky when they picked me and put me uh, with Sonny King. And uh, at the time, don't get me wrong, we didn't break no records, you know, of attendance. But Memphis didn't die. You see what I'm saying? I mean, we didn't, I mean, we drew good money. And we made good money. And I learned a lot from Sonny King. You know, he taught me a lot of things that you didn't know about this business, you know. At that time, <clears throat> and uh, I was very respectful of Sonny. Matter of fact, you know, I got to know Sonny real good. and He helped me a lot. I got to say this for before I'm out today, Sonny King helped me a hell of a lot. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. then when, <laughs> okay, so what time period are we looking at here? You. You were working with Jared. I mean, you started yeah, to break okay, out after then, that. Okay, then you got to understand that <clears throat> that was up there with Sonny King. Now uh, Lawler's leg was healed, mm -hmm. and Dundee come back. That ain't the point that there's no room for me. But see, I was in that spot up here, and with those guys coming back, it wasn't part of me being jealous or nothing. But you know, you're gonna have to move right. down because these guys were the, they were the man. You know what I'm saying? They were the ones that drew the one. They're, they're the ones that, that when they come back, it sold out. Right. You see what I'm saying? That's respect. So instead of me taking that fall back down that territory right there in La Under, I, I went. I had opportunity to go to uh, work for Leroy McGurk in Oklahoma uh, City. So uh, naturally, I went and talked to Jerry Jerry about it. And Jerry Jerry told me it'd be a great move for me. Uh, why don't you do that? And go out to Tulsa, stay there for a while, and things aren't. But you know, if things ain't going to get there, you come back home. This is your home, Ricky. You know, but and uh, so I did that, and I went on out to Oklahoma mm -hmm. and worked for Leroy McGurk. Well, why don't you talk about that a little bit? Well, that was my first time ever leaving home. You now you uh, lived in Nashville at this time, or, yes. or did you relocate to Memphis? Or no, I, I stayed in Nashville. That's where I was from. Lived there. Yeah. Uh. Uh. Matter of fact, this is after uh, I was married to my wife Connie. We uh, lived in Nashville, and uh, so now I gotta go to Oklahoma. It's my first time. At the time we had no children, so we're you know me and her we we're, we're leaving, going to Oklahoma, not knowing what we're bound it for, what we're going. But you know we had a little money saved because of something. So then you know we loaded up the hills and moved to Beverly. You know so, but no we. Loaded up with cars and brother, the next day I know I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, working for Leroy McGurk, and which is another thing there, uh, when I got there they didn't have no young baby faces. So brother, I fit right in the spot. Mm -hmm. You know, you had a uh, workers out, you know, your baby face there was Bob Sweetan. You remember Bob Sweetan? Yeah, remember. You know, but, you know, Bob uh, looked like everything but a baby face. But as working wise he was a baby face. You know, he, he got over, he knew how to work. And you had Tom Jones. Uh, it's hard to remember back in the days, but you know, uh, but we worked with people like Mike George, Ed Kowalski, Ed, uh, who's the guy, Ed Kowalski? Killer? Killer Kowalski? No, no, no. He wrestled for, uh, AWO for, as Colonel the Beards. Uh, what was his name? Yeah, well, Ed Kulikowski. Okay. Ed Kulikowski, that was it. It's hard for me to pronounce those Polish names, but there we go. No offense, but as we got, you know, 
So I went out there and I started a, like a little program out there, which then you run Tulsa every Monday night, and you was in your Fort Smith, Tuesday, Springfield, Missouri, uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas, Little Rock. It was that area. Bill Watts at the time on the lower, it was, it was called the Mid South Territory at the time, but Bill Watts on the part in Louisiana, Lever McGork on the top part. And after a while, after I left, you know, Bill Watts took all this over, saying what territory, this is how long ago this was. Right. So I stayed out there for about four months, and then they was looking for another young baby face. You know, you couldn't be, do you know somebody you want? And I knew the perfect partner at the time. I was Eddie Gilbert, you know, many Eddie were good friends, you know. Uh, so I, I called Eddie and asked him, so, man, would you come out here? And, where was Eddie working for at the time? Eddie's he's working in Memphis. He was but, you know, he was in the same slot that I was at, because Eddie was there, too, at the same thing. But, you know, when Bill and all the, you know, you all dropped down. And I called Eddie. He said, sure, man, I'd love to come out there. So Eddie came out there. And believe it or not, brother, we were successful as a tag team out there. We worked some, uh, yeah, Skander Ackbar as the manager. And, damn, you know, it's small territory, but we did, you know, it was good. You know, what a great learning experience, too, because you're on your own, you know. Uh, but you know, I learned to, uh, the points about that, being on your own in territory, uh, learning about other boys, learning how to, you know, in different areas they work different too. You know, it's, it's a little bit faster pace or a little bit slower pace. But you know, it, it was good out there. We stayed there about six months, and uh, matter of fact, we got over good. And Jerry, Jerry heard about us. You know, and called uh, on the phone and said, "Man, I heard y'all was doing good out there. Since uh, I'm looking for a." But you know, in the middle tag team, uh, you and Eddie Gilbert, and at the time in Memphis they had Oh Fuji and Nita. Remember them, Onita? Mm -hmm. Onita, which owns FMW now, big movie star in Japan. They were hot with Tojo Yamamoto, and it was just finishing their angle off of Lawler and Dundee. You know, and they bring another heel team in, but you know they kept the heat on these Japanese guys. They over like hell. So, uh, then Eddie went back into Memphis and did an angle with them and. Personally, brother, you know, it's kept us right there in the middle for a long time. We did pretty damn good at that. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was a concession stand angle, right? We yes, that was right after we come in. If you notice on that right there, it's where we just come from Oklahoma. I'm wearing cowboy boots as as, uh, <laughs> as my wrestling shoes because you know after in Oklahoma you're in a big turn big belt buckle and a cowboy hat territory. So me and Eddie both wore like like cowboy Ricky Morton. Or, mm -hmm. We didn't call us that, you know, but you were dressed like that. We come back in for success, uh, uh, success stand too below. It was a remake of uh, the original for Lawler and Dundee and uh, the Blind Bombers. Mm -hmm. You know, it already been done once. It worked successfully. It worked pretty good the second time. You know, we, uh, it was it was different doing that. It was fun. Hurt a little bit. <laughs> But, uh, well, we'll try to find the footage and mix that uh, concession stand ball in there. But do you have any other memories about that? That was the one where the ladies freaked out, right? Wasn't it? Yeah, it was Her uh, Herman Shetfield, the promoter of the town. His wife got caught in the middle of it. Didn't know she's screaming. She didn't want the hell to do. You know, right. she even slapped Tojo on it. I think. You know, tried to slap him get him off. <laughs> oh yeah, I remember you know, Tojo's dead now. It's one part on there where I got this pot, and I I remember. Uh, Somebody hit me across the back of the board. You know, it stings like hell. God. And I had that pot. And I remember I hit Tojo on top of the head with it and went, boom. Tojo looked at me and went, whoa, whoa. You know, just that face. I, I get to laughing. And then when I turn around, there's a big old thing of ice water. The ice, and Eddie Gilbert was going to pour it on somebody. And he picked it up, the ice water, put it on Eddie Gilbert. And he's running in place trying to get away from it. freezing like hell. Oh, man, to fill his boots up full of ice. Oh, it's, it's funny as hell, man. Those days, you know, it's, you know what? No way you could ever replace those days, man. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. So, so you were in the middle there, and you worked that feud with the. Yeah, we worked with them for a while, and uh, Eddie had opportunity to go uh, to Kansas City to work for Bob Dowd. Mm -hmm. You know, and plus, that's where, you know, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie had a great plan for this business. You know, he, you know, he like, I could tell. Earlier in, in the years that the Eddie was going to be a booker somewhere, you know, because you know his dad was a great wrestler, Tommy Gilbert, and plus his brother Doug. But Eddie had the mind for the business, you know what I'm saying? So you know Eddie had the opportunity to go to Kansas City, where I think he'd be involved, in, you know, in the office. It's a great opportunity. We was young, you know, we couldn't, went not marry each other, you know, but when he went his way, and I stayed there in Memphis, and, you know, which Eddie.
pretty good. Hell, he wound up booking a lot of territories, you know, even WCW. Yeah. You know, I was proud for him. Uh, but uh, from there, I was there on my own, and they did another little angle where they, they had uh, my partner, Ken Lucas. And uh, these days, it's, it's hard for a lot of guys to remember such great workers, but Ken Lucas is one of the uh, his era was one of the best baby faces that they could ever imagine. He was the one that showed you that. If you ever notice, back in the old days, when I used to do my comeback. I look at the people who do this right here. Well, I stole that from Ken Lucas. Because, brother, I mean, he, used to, he was over so much, all he had to do was do this right here. And people, you know, here. And people start going, oh, oh, oh. I mean, he was over, brother. Especially down in the Pensacola Mobile area. That's the best how much over this guy was. And Luke. Man, what a, I got to say, you know, what's the college in the ring? It wasn't great. So he could, uh, he helped us out so, helped me out so much. They teamed, well, they did an angle where it's, it's hard for me to remember back this thing, but it's going to be Ken Lucas and Bill Dundee. <coughs> going to work for the title match. This is where they get my big break. You got to understand then, I worked the car in Memphis that night, and they, they put me over real quick, over a good heel. Boom, you know, Ricky Morton wins, blah, 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 and more people popping. So I come back and I got my street clothes on. And Bill Dundee's fixing to do an, an angle with another heel, I can't remember who it was. So him and Ken Lucas are going out to wrestle Gypsy Joe and Frank Morrell at the time, which is the French Angel. They were you know, tag team champions. Excuse me. So on the way to the ring, see, it's how you wore jangles back then. The heel he's going to do the angle with come out and hit Bill Dundee from behind with a gimmick with a cheer in the back of the head, put the boots to him, brother, and blah, 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 blah. He can't continue the match. So that's Ken Lucas by himself. But you got to understand, Dundee's fixed to go into angle with this heel to just beat him. So that was his deal. He did was get out of the tag match. So he always set up, bring him back. I got my street clothes on. Ken Lucas out there, he got a partner. So Ken he gets on the microphone. Well, I go find me a partner. He goes back, he gets beat. I got my street clothes on. I just take my shirt off and go to the ring. I have a fucking match, boom, 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 and I win the match for me and Ken Lucas, and me and him become the champions. Mm -hmm. That was instantly over. You see what I'm saying? All right. God damn it, here's a newborn baby face. See, that's how you did things back then. People believed in what you done. Fuck, it was unreal, you know, because, you know, you did things that was real. It wasn't things that, like, uh, well, uh, my best friend over here wants to be a wrestler, okay, we'll make him a champion. You know, you worked for it, man. And you, you told this story of a soap opera. For a year, you know, weeks and underneath, and boom, here comes my big chance, and I took it and took the, took the most out of it. Boom, where was that? So Ken Lucas and I become tag team champions. You know, we worked, stayed there for about a, a year and a half, brother. We had a hell of a run there with all different kinds of, you know, losing the title, winning the back, losing the titles, because this time Lawler was working his single. Lawler was the unified world heavyweight champion. And Bill Dundee was the Mid-South heavyweight champion, so you got Bill working with people like Billy Robinson, Tony Charles, you know, Lawler working with his Kamalas, Joe LaDukes, you know, you had that, you know, this main event, Bill was semi-main event, or they switched it back and forth, and, uh, and then, you know, we have our tag match, which is years, which is funny, though, it's always like the deal where Bill Dundee and Jerry Lawler hated each other because they always wanted that top spot, but what a work that was, you know, I, I knew that. All they did was see, they were smart. They even let the boys believe that. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Because when the boys believe it, so did the people. I mean, I never forget the first night Bill Dundee and Jerry Law ever wrestled each other. Shit. Brother, you could have sold out the Liberty Bow out there in Memphis. Hell, they turned away more people in the building. Hell, hell what? 18,000 people? Shit. It was so packed, it was unreal. And it worked it so great. I'll never forget they made all the baby faces come out and sit by the ring. All the hills on the side to watch this great match take place. You see, and even Bill Dundee and Jerry Lawler, you know, they act like they hated each other. Well, in front of the boys, you know, because they always want to knock this one, want to knock this one, want to knock this one. But brother, when you put them two together, you know what that made? Money signs all the way across. They sold out everywhere they went. Mm -hmm. I mean, time and time and time and time again. I don't give a shit, you break them up, book them back two weeks later, they sold out again. Yeah. You see, that's the way the business worked. And that's the way you took care of this business. Uh, you know, it's, I was, I'm proud to be a part of that part to learn. You know, you sit there and see Jerry Lawler. We talked to Bill Dundee. You think you hate Jerry Lawler's guts. And then you talk to Jerry Lawler. They hate his guts. Then you see them together like, well, you assholes. Y'all ain't blah, blah, blah. 
But then, you know, you know, a way to knock each other, but brother, when they come together, there was nothing but money. All it was was money. Boy, the guys were smart, boy. They, they think they wasn't. The banks see anything they want to about them. But brother, they, when they drew money and got paid by the asses of their seats, they was making a hell of a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, How did this, the Southwest Championship Wrestling fit into this in terms of the time period? What do you mean Southwest? Uh, uh, well, I was watching the match with uh, when you were working Gino and Tully. Okay, no, okay, they got to understand this right here. You know, Luke, Ken Lucas and I had our run in, uh, in Memphis. See, back then you had a lot of territories. Mm -hmm. See, so, you know, it was our time to go. You know what I'm saying? It's time for a new babyface tag team to come in. And uh, I think at that time it was Ricky and Robert Gibson were coming into Memphis. And you know, Enzo over too, brother. That's a hell of a tag team. I don't know you about guys ever know Ricky Gibson, Robert's brother. <laughs> Bro, he was a natural. One of the best wrestlers. You know, if, it's, if he would have stayed in physical shape, you know, he was in car wrecks and stuff. Unbelievable. If these guys these days could see him work back then, they wouldn't believe it. It was way ahead of his time. But Ken Lucas and I went on the Southwest Championship Wrestling, which was based out of San Antonio. Joe Blanchard was the promoter there, Tully's daddy. And uh, we went in that territory as, as me, you know, that's a more of a Hispanic, you know, Hispanic people, right. Mexican people that lived that territory. So they brought me as a young, blonde headed white meat baby face with the older, mean street fighting partner. And uh, it clicked. Uh, we went to uh, San Antonio territory, which at the time we worked for Paul Bosch too, out of Houston, Texas. That's when Paul was alive. He ran the Houston area. And uh, we stayed, me and Luke, Luke said we stayed there for about two years. Had a hell of a run with, you know, with the grapplers. <coughs> Excuse me, damn. Uh, Tony Anthony, Glenn Ditton, which later came on the Dirty White Boys. What a great tag team they were. Uh, Gino and Tully were with them. Then you brought people in like Dick Murdoch, Terry Funk, Robert, I, I mean, Ken Lucas and I worked with. <coughs> we had a great run, <coughs> excuse me there, for about two years. Very successfully. Mm -hmm. It was good. So, when, when, is there anything in between this and when you ended up joined it up with uh, Robert Gibson and No, it wasn't. This is uh, this is what's so funny about uh about the situation. At the time you have to understand that uh back in Memphis, Tennessee, you know, that was always home. And we'd have been there for like two years and Robert Ricky Gibson been up there and did their thing and they left. And at the time in Memphis they, they had a tag team called the Fabulous Ones. Steve Kern and Stan Lane. What I wanted to is to tell you how I went back to Memphis. Mm -hmm. And brother, they were over. Let's get to a point where mm -hmm. Jerry Lawler and Jerry Jarrett were fighting. You know, so Lawler was going to split away from Jerry Jarrett. And you know, Jerry had a, so he needed a baby face tag team that could equal up to the fabulous ones because they was over. Right. That he'd give a hell of a push to and understood what he wanted that they could do, you know, to make it successful. So, uh, I'm in the Hemisphere Arena, San Antonio, Texas. And uh, Lawler come walking in the dressing room. <laughs> uh, you know, he sat down and told me the situation, what he's gonna do. He says, I like to come up with a gimmick and put you and Robert Gibson together. He said, man, both y'all guys, he said, I know that you know, it's hard back then being a booker, because you had to understand things that you wanted to do. That's the reason bookers did a lot of the angles themselves, because they knew what they wanted to do to draw money. But when you could find somebody that you could do, do the angles that you wanted, that's the kind of people they wanted, you see what I'm saying? And he knew that Robert and I do it, we listened, you know. So it was Jerry Lawler that actually thought up of the Rock and Roll Express, really? Jerry Lawler and Jimmy Hart. Yeah. And Dutch Band Tail, because they, you know, they ran together. But, uh, so, uh, he talked to me. And, Two weeks later, I went back to Memphis, Tennessee. But what was bad there, the time Robert and I got there, Jerry, Jerry, and Jerry Lawler made up. But the Fabulous One was still the top tag team, and Robert and I were, were the underneath tag team. They, and uh, so we got there, Jimmy Hart and Lawler, you know, they come up, and Jerry Lawler came up with the Rocket, well, it was the R&R Express. Ricky and Robert Express. Mm -hmm. 
and then we're just looking through these books. Don't forget, we're looking for some spot show in Indiana. We're looking, and Lawler like, goes, God, that's a cool outfit right there. It's David Lee, David Lee Roth singing, you know, he had these bandanas and stuff on him. He said, let's do something like that. And he get the thing, he says, we'll call it the Rock and Roll Express, man. It'll be different. So, <laughs> damn, brother, we went to, uh, it was in Sunday afternoon in Memphis, was our first show was being the Rock and Roll Express. And they had a flea market across the street from the Coliseum on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Here, me and Lawler and Robert, we go over to the flea market, right? Lawler brought some long tights from his old stuff. I never forget one of them, a pair of maroon ones, and the other one was like skin colored. That's the ones I gave Robert. <laughs> and his brother, he looked like he was naked wearing those things, right? <laughs> so we're in the back dressing room, and boy, we're wearing Lawler up about feathers. He's got bandanas. we got shit tied on us, brother. Uh, I walked up the door, and some guy said, God damn, when you're a what are you, a gypsy or Indian? <laughs> I never forget that. <laughs> and me and Robert's looking at where the bear says, hell, brother. Yeah. Oh, we went, no, we've been wearing these short tights. And what the fuck are we going to do, Robert? I'm looking at Robert. He's looking at me. <laughs> hey, Robert, that bell ain't playing our music. They've been plugging the Rock and Roll Express. They didn't get no names to be here. Bye, 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 bye. Bye, 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 bye. The boy, we looked at each other. But it's like we had our heads down. We run into the ring. But you know what? The fucking people loved us. Boom, it clicked. You know, we're in the ring working, but we got all this shit hanging, flying off of us. We, you know, we don't know where to wind our ass or scratch our watch, man. We we get through all this stuff, so. God damn, the match is over. Boy, the people pop big time and come back. Lawler sits there and looks at, damn, buddies, y'all gonna get over. And, uh, but, you know, since the time we're, we're fighting the element with with the fabulous ones, because they were the tag team, I gotta hand that to them, but the guys were over. We had to play that second part of the fiddle. But, you know, we, uh, did our angles with, well, that's when the grapplers came back in Memphis and Robert and I, at the time, which is good too, Memphis ran two towns a night just about, except for your big shows. So, you know, we worked spot shows with the grapplers and which, brother, we, you know, a lot of them sold out. Mm -hmm. So it was doing good, but we went back to the point again, it was our job, like the Zambu Express come in. Robert and I had to put them over <laughs> for the fabulous ones to work with them. You see what I'm saying? Right. So it was a point like that. And i never forget this in a, this is great. Bill Watts came up to it. Bill Watts at the time's territory was, you know, dragging ass. He couldn't couldn't understand, blah, blah, blah. So he got Bill Dundee to come down and look at his, look at him and says, Jesus, you know, he said, what's wrong with my territory? And Bill looked at him and says, God damn, what's wrong with your territory? So he's a baby face, he's a heels. He said, every baby face is six foot eight, ugly as shit, and all your heels are too. I mean, hey, what the hell you want? I said, he just said, you need some young baby faces in here. He said, I need, said, I said, I need to find some of that. That's what brings him to Memphis. And a matter of fact, Robert and I are wrestling uh, Port Chop Cash and Troy Graham, the Bruise Brothers. They was over. And we, but we went about 30 minutes. And see, my deal back then was selling and giving Robert a hot tag. See, here I am, Bill Watts, you know, he, he thinks I'm a midget. He looks at Robert Gibson, but he watches our match. And he come back, he said, boys, he said, I never thought about this, but I've seen something. I said, man, you sold and never died and never buried your partner. Something i never seen before. I've never seen a guy sell like that before. He said, it's unreal how you did that. And he said, right, and he thought for a minute, and him and Bill Dundee walked off, and he come back and said, I'll tell you what, I want to give you a top spot. I'm going to try it in my territory. I want you to come to Louisiana. So he worked a deal with Jerry Jarrett. Well, we go there for six months. They're going to like switch talents for six months, right? We've been playing second fiddle to the fabulous ones, which is all right. The guys are over. I'm not, you know, sitting up bad. Just Steve and Stan were over. The great tag team. But we went to Louisiana. <laughs> we're in Shreveport, Louisiana on TV. I walked in, brother. I look like Cowboy Lane. I've never in my life seen so many big people in my life. There wasn't nobody in that damn dressing room under six foot eight. Oh my God, we walk in, Bill Watts introduces us. See these two boys right here? I'm going to make them up baby faces. They hit you, you think that I did too. Same thing later on, you go here, tell another story, something similar to that. That was Bill Watts. Rock and Roll Express. But at the time before that, you got to understand this is how you draw money too. Jimmy Cornetta took the Midnight Express. They were in Louisiana. And they were working with Magnum TA and and Mr. Wrestling number two at the time. And Brother at Midnight Express had more heat than anything. And that's what Bill Watts is looking at. Perfect 
tag team to work with the Midnight Express because they was over. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, you know, because Louisiana's never seen nothing like this before. You know, these bean cheating ass heels and the manager of the he's in the goddamn tennis racket. Oh my God. So uh, we had to go in and, and we, but first of all, he had to get us over before we could meet them. So the first day in, we did an angle with Crusher Khrushchev and uh, Nikolai Bokov. The brother got over. Boom. First time Bill Watts couldn't believe it. They were selling out with these guys. We even did the angle with them in the Express yet. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So blah 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 blah. We did our first angle we met the Midnight Express. Hell, Bill Watts got rich. Brother, we sold out at, I mean spot shows we were doing. At this time, you understand, spot show doing seventeen thousand dollars. It's unheard of. You know? My God, blah blah blah. And then our six months is over. Jerry Jarrett wants us back in Memphis because the family wants it left. Alright. Well hell. We're just now getting over in Louisiana. I don't want to go back home. But Bill Watts has to send us back home. And it's not against Jerry Jarrett or, or nothing, but I knew where I was headed to. So I went back to Memphis and gave my notice. You know? I'm working here this week, but I'm going back to Louisiana. I mean Robert's over there and said, I won't go hit between you and Bill Watts. But I'm making money there. You know, I mean, Bill Watts built up the right <coughs> way here. Him and Bill Dundee. They took their time with us. They groomed us. And they built us. And brother, them Cajun people. And them Texas people and them Oklahoma people, they loved me and Robert. Mm -hmm. You know, brother, shit. That's what we went through those scaffold matches at. You know, as a matter of fact, our first time we met the Midnight Express in Shreveport. No, not Shreveport. Uh, let me think of it now. Lafayette. Lafayette, Louisiana, the first time we met the Midnight Express there, Robert and I got out of the car and the camera crew met us. They looked at us and said, guys, we've never seen nothing like this before. He said, people have been camped out here for, for a week to buy tickets to watch you guys wrestle. You know how they, when they camp out for concerts? Uh -huh. They camped out for Robert and I. Wow. Camped out for a week for tickets to go on sale to see me and Robert wrestle. It was sold the slap fuck out. <laughs> so you know, that's how it was. I mean, they took their time with us, but you know, you understand, it was hard, brother. We worked our ass off. You know, we was a little baby faces wrestling these big heels and ba -bum, but but you go back to the thing again, it was respect. These big heels do, we were selling out. The big heels do, if we're going to sell out, that means they're going to get a big damn check, too. You understand? So, boom, we all worked together. And, brother, we went on through our thing with our scaffold matches, cage matches. Brother, you talking about real rights. Some of these guys today would piss the shit all over yourself for things like that happened to them in the ring. When you're sitting there wrestling and 14 guys come in the ring swinging chairs and knives and everything they get their hands on, it's a whole different ball game, buddy, a whole different story. You they know? probably never seen money like that before at this time. Well, you know, if you understand, you know, back then we got paid by my asses you put the seats. You know, having a big year, it wasn't like it is nowadays. These guys have a big year and don't do nothing. You know, what, work TV three times a week? <coughs> they none of them had to get in their cars and drive 300 miles on a two lane highway to Little Rock, Arkansas, then drive back and be in New Orleans, Louisiana the next night, 300 miles other way, you see. That's the way it was every day. With no days off. And if you ever got a day off, it was your, your hometown that was running. That's what's so bad about it. If you lived in Alexander, okay, Alexander's running Monday night. <coughs> Ricky, you're off. Why, why the hell can't I be off a little rock? You know, you know, but it didn't work like that. You know, that's the way things work. Yeah. So how long did that run with the Midnight Express last? That, For a decade. Not, you know that. No, no. <laughs> the original one, because you, you branched out into other Well, just, at the time, just with Bill you know, things go on. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Uh, that was the first time you met Cornette, too, probably, right? I mean, it, no, man. For, well, no, okay, time now time. I'm going to go back the first time right. I met Cornette. Now we're going to stop this... Cut. <laughs> we're going way back. Jimmy Cornette was uh, back when we were the first time I started Memphis for Jerry. Jerry and I wrestled Kenway. No, no. Okay. First time I wrestled. No, we go on because okay. I'm going right back to where I was at. Jimmy Cornette used to be the mark around the ring taking pictures. Yeah. He had, you know, he wore knee pads taking pictures. Every week I'd buy my gimmick pictures to sell from Jimmy Cornette because he took them in the back. Mm -hmm. But Jerry, Jerry, but Jimmy, boy, he had that attitude. Jerry Jarrett met him and said, boy, if you get as much heat with the people you can the boys, I can draw some money with you. Because <laughs> Jimmy, you know, he had some heat. <laughs> God damn. And this one thing I was, uh, but see, understand the story about the riots and stuff. 
That's how you learn how to respect people. You know, people ask me, what do you think about Jimmy Cornette? Well, I watched Jimmy Cornette mature in this business. And remember me tell you, Jimmy Cornette's got a hell of a mind for this business. Great mind. And one day people will see. He gets that one break, you can see what I'm talking about. He's going to have a great opportunity for this business. But, which now he's in WWF. But Jimmy Cornette, I watched this fucker learn how to fight. You know, here was Jimmy, this, he looked like the, the nerd out there with them glasses on. He's got that tennis racket. My mama's got all the money. Ba 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 ba. And these marks are banging him back to the goddamn head. Bro, I mean, I'm, I ain't shitting you. Bro, I mean, you had rights then. I watched that son of a bitch one time where he just had enough. Fuck it. Brother, he come at some bitch. He started fighting. And from then on, I watched that fucker fight every night. And Jimmy become. Don't, and don't tell me, don't, don't let anybody bullshit you. If you don't think he won't fight you, you're full of shit. He might take an ass whooping, but he'll fight you. So my hat's off to Jimmy for that. So now, where are we at there? What did I just stop off for? We're back in Watts. Well, back in Watts territory. Yeah. yeah, we weren't going to lose anything. So, but we, we done broke every record Bill Watts has ever had. You know, but we done sold out Little Rock, Houston, goddamn street. Every, every show we went to was sold out, you know, for months and months. But the run was over, now it's time, you know, loser leave town. And we beat the Midnight Express, and they go to, uh, Dallas, and uh, we stayed in Louisiana. That's when we started working with uh, Hector and Chavo Guerrero, mm -hmm. great Mexican tag team. What he, God damn, they was they were great too. They were funny, and uh, that tells a story one time about that. You know those things they wear with the bullets that go over them. I forgot what you call them. They they, get, they hold the bullets for the Mexicans with the hats. We're coming to the ring one night, and Chavo's a hill. He swing them together, and when he did, one of the bullets hit the other bullets. But I didn't know, I thought it was real. It was blanks, but it still went off. But they hit them so much the other way. Bow, 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 bow. Hell, it scared the shit out of him. He threw things running in the air. He's a big heel. Hey, I mean, Robert died on the damn ground. We didn't know what was going on, but you had to be there. Was, what a funny story that was. To be that part, we laughed for the whole match about that son of a bitch. Oh, brother, I thought that son of a bitch shot me, right? <laughs> God, it was great. But, you know, we went up through the angle with him, drew a lot of money. Uh, then we went with... Uh, Ted DiBiase, Dr. Death, Steve Williams. Learned a lot, what a great work at Ted DiBiase with Steve, with Steve Williams, too, at the time. And uh, we, uh, a lot of members of stories back then. Uh, and then we went with uh, Wrestling 1 and 2, Johnny Walker and Hercules Hernandez. Had great swims. Then at the meantime, Cornette and them have already left there and went to work for Jimmy Crockett in North Carolina. And about this time is when we was working. At, this time we were working with. Uh, Had Bill Watts taken over the whole area? Oh yeah, yeah. He's a, okay. all that right there. Yeah, but uh, at this time, Jimmy Crockett was taking over TBS. You see, he didn't, he didn't ball all that. Dusty was a booker, but we're going back to the part. You know, we were working with Steve Williams, Ted DiBiase, Michael Hayes, Terry Gordy. You know, in that area there. And uh, tell you how wild it was back in those days, man. You used to go down in, in the bayou and work. A place called Galliano, Louisiana. You know, at this time, I done perfected the, the art of selling. I figured out in this business here, you got a tag team, whatever you got to sell. Baby face don't sell, you can draw no money. And if the, heat's don't, if the heels don't have no heat, you can draw no money. So we done had all this. Steve Williams had the heat. You know, and I was the young little baby face. And I wrestled Steve Williams. Dr. Death Steve Williams, baddest motherfucker in the world. You know what I'm talking about? Lightning shooting from his elbows. Y'all seen this guy at this time? I mean, Doc, brother, he was unreal. So I'm wrestling down in Galliano, Louisiana. I told Doc, for when I said, Doc, you watch these people out here, brother. I said, they, uh, they're pretty, you know, they're mean as hell. Fuck them. I said, all right. <laughs> I've been there before, so I'm out there having that match, and Steve's getting heat on me, and I start selling. And I watched Steve, he's looking around, and Mark's coming through the ropes, right? <laughs> he's going, Ricky, get up and make a comeback. I says, oh no, you tough son of a bitch. <laughs> he said, get up and make a comeback. God damn it, right now, Steve's champion, right? <laughs> Steve's going to beat me in a match, you know, because he's a champion. I got a single match with him. He's going to fight me at the end. Blah, blah, blah. Look up, he's hitting mother. He says, get up and small package me, god damn it. <laughs> Brother, I got small package to beat him. <laughs> Had to, brother. People coming through them ropes. <laughs> He gets out of the ring and he's fighting all people sticking cigarettes to him. He's fighting all the way back 
to the back, and we got the door, the because the of the crowd so bad, the heels had the door locked. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't get in. <laughs> Brother, he kicked that damn door. I mean, hinge and wall, drywall, and everything went down. <laughs> he go, you stupid son of a bitch. Then they're going to kill me, right? Oh, I never forgot that. Me and Steve laugh about that all the time. It was funny as hell, man. What a, <laughs> what a great story that was. But uh, like I was saying, in the meantime, now, we were working with... Bill Watts was working with uh, Fritz von Erich at the time. You know, just using switching talent back and forth. We were going up to Dallas working some, and the von Erichs were coming down. And at the time, you know, Flair was coming in working with Kerry, but they had a whole thing going with the world title. So Flair, matter of fact, we were working with uh, as well at the end. Midnight Express we were in Charlotte, but they come back for the Loser League Town match. And Flair's on the card, and uh, Flair watched a match. Well, Flair, you know, see Flair, you know, great guy. He didn't talk much about the business when when you when the show was over. You know what I'm saying? But that, then you came fame. The heels, the baby faces didn't rush together, and Flair was a heel, so mm -hmm. nobody ever did. So, uh, let's say Flair watched a match. I didn't know this, you know what I'm saying? But, but boom! So, but let's say this Flair went back and told Jimmy Crockett. Well, there's a hell of a tag team down in Louisiana, and we're fixing to take this TBS over. She said, y'all see these summer guns, blah, 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 they're over. So we're having our big show in, uh, in uh, Shreveport, I mean, uh, New Orleans in Superdome. Muhammad Ali's there. You know, he's a special referee, Jake Roberts and them, and we're wrestling uh, Michael Hayes. And Terry Gordy wasn't with him at the time. It was, might have been Michael Hayes and Ted DiBiase or somebody. But uh, I'm sitting in the dressing room and uh, I have my little boy there with me. And this is great because Muhammad Ali was there that night and I couldn't believe this. Muhammad Ali walked in the door. Still saying hi to anybody. He says, my little boy sitting by my locker here with his little trucks. Playing. Muhammad Ali came in and sat right on the floor by my little boy and started playing trucks with him. To say hi to nobody. Started playing with my little boy. They looked up, started asking me questions. This is how long you love kids, you know. And I, I, I really like that. You know what I'm saying? To, I love boys sit there and play with them, and <laughs> drugs. You know, yeah. it's great. <laughs> but so I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden I see Jimmy Crockett walk in the dressing room. I never met Jimmy Crockett. I just saw I see this guy walk in, and I heard him say, "Hey, Jimmy Crockett, how you doing?" Blah 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 blah. You know, I got up, shook hands, said, "How you doing?" So I'm just sitting there, and I'm getting dressed, and uh, everybody walked out of the room. Jimmy Crockett walked in, just says. I wanted to talk to you. I come all the way from Charlotte. I heard so much about you. I flew here from Charlotte, North Carolina, just to watch you wrestle all night. And I went, wow. You know, he told me right that we freaked out. I said, okay. So uh, I went back and I talked about Buzz, Michael Hayes. I said, brother, Bob, Jimmy Crockett come here to watch you. He said, and Jimmy Crockett's going to get his money's worth, too. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Michael, I think Ted DV, it was Ted DV, I said. We told him. I said, I said, is that cool? He said, brother, that's the best thing that ever happened to you. Yeah, we went out, there was 40,000 people there, just super dumb. Mm -hmm. We went out and had our match. <laughs> brother, I was just throwing left. Ted DiBiase and Michael Hayes fly off the top rope. You know what I'm saying? Brother, they're putting us over like a sound bitch. Boom, double drop kick. We beat Michael Hayes. One, two, three. Come back. And uh, come back, Jimmy Crockett says, you're what I'm looking for. He says, I need to, uh, I will make you my world champions. First day on TV. He said, so once you make it here, we can. He said, I'll double that. I want to, you know, what I'm talking about, but I want to double that. <laughs> you know? So uh, I gave my notice. And I went to, went to uh, North Carolina. Well, Robert and I went to North Carolina. But see, at the time, they got the Midnight Express getting hot. See? Yeah. But, Understand this, there was nobody ever hotter than the Russians. Ivan Koloff, Nikita Koloff, and Crusher Khrushchev, Barry Dorso. Uh -huh. Brother, I've never in my life ever seen. Plus, at the time, it's when we, the United States was having a lot of trouble with the Soviet Union. You see, so it's a perfect time to do this angle, you know, me and Robert, the, the all American kids, and you got, uh, you know, the Russians there, and, you know, 
And plus, we had a lot of videos back then. I sit all them videos in the, I'm sorry, and the show them on TV. Boom, 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 back and forth. Well, our first, before we even got there, we was over. You know what I'm saying? Hell, they ain't never seen a tag team come out dancing, playing music, and we're out here, blah, 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 blah. So, we're in Shelby, North Carolina. Well, no, we got there on that day. On that Dusty, we, go, we come in, uh, that's on a Tuesday, we do a TV in Shelby, North Carolina, in Charlotte. Dusty called Robert and I to the office. Didn't know Dusty at the time. Well, I, you know, I knew who he was. I, seen, I met him several different times, but didn't never work for him. And you gotta understand, Dusty run a territory like a football team. He was the head coach, or well, he was a quarterback. So he called it, let me tell you, boy, this is my football team here. You know, don't get me wrong. And a lot of, you know, everybody has their disagreements, and everybody has their good agreements. And I'm not mocking Dusty, but you know, that's the way Dusty put this. I'm the quarterback, and y'all the running back. As long as you can carry the ball, you can carry it. So in other words, what he's telling us, as long as you carry the people in the ring, as long as you keep your work up, you're gonna be you be starting backs. And if you wasn't, your ass would go. That's the way he put it. But Dusty put it in his words. Right. So we understood it, and he did too. So we went to Shelby, North Carolina, do two tapings. They brought us out, the brothers sold the fuck out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They brought us out there. We worked with Joel Deaton. And Michael Hayes' cousin, uh, I can't think of his name now, out of Pensacola, Florida. But we beat them in like 15 seconds. Double drop. We hit the ring, boom, 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 boom. They went them out, shut them off, double drop, kick. Those are finished. They had it over on TV with the videos. One, two, three, we went crazy. For the next taping, we got the Russians for the world titles. We went the whole TV tape. So, in other words, they built this sub bitch. They got Magnum TA, special commentary. Uh, they built this match up so good, Dusty did. Got a mind for it, but he put, he put it together. And he came up with the finish where he wanted me, well, he got Robert fixed to beat Robert, and I come up behind Ivan and beat him somehow. That's what I come up with. I call it the horse. People call it the Victor Row. You jump on the backs and roll over. Mm -hmm. So, we, that match, that TV show was our, we went 53 minutes. Inside that building, and brother had to be 120 degrees in that building. I never forget when I came back after that match, I took my shoe off, I pulled sweat out of my boot like water. And uh, but they worked it so good, that Dusty had everything down. That when we won those belts, boom, it's like we won the Super Bowl, which we did. We won the world titles. Here I am, Robert and I, a little team from Memphis, Tennessee, that's traveled through all these territories, all this right here, and we finally make the big time for that first big shot. And we win the son of a bitch, the underdogs of everybody. Because Ivan, before we even got there, see, Ivan, yes, well, that's one of the promoters were great. Since I used to draw money back then. Ivan, Nikita, they buried a, beat everybody facing the territory. <coughs> Nobody could beat them, including Dusty, him and Manny Fernandez, including Magnum T.A. You know, they knew we were coming, that's how you drew money. So, brother, when we hit that son of a bitch, and we beat them for that one, two, three, all the boys hit the ring, but plus all them just picked us up. And brother, you, you, you can just hear it, feel it there. Boy, we hit something here. <laughs> and Dusty done through that pick and hit that gold mine. Boom, you know what I'm saying? Um, just some of the things that I remember watching is you know, your program with uh, Ric Flair mm -hmm. when you, when you uh, went back to singles. Yeah. How did that fit in with uh, where we were up to the point with the NWA? Well, Flair and our people to work with. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And besides that, here goes, well, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you about Ric Flair, since we're, once we start this right here. I heard an interview on TV the other day, where Anderson says, we are in the house that Ric Flair built. Well, no, Arn, I gotta take that away from me. We are in the business that Ric Flair built. This man is ungodly. The best to ever put on a pair of wrestling boots. To understand, he's a world champion, brother. Every night, our Broadways. Every night, the $3,000 suits. Brothers, Ric Flair is Ric Flair. There's nobody, 
this business ever take his place. I don't give a damn what anybody says. This business is Ric Flair's business. He built it like it is today. And these guys need to know that. They need to respect that and understand that you just don't go out there and expect Ric Flair to do something, you know, to benefit somebody else. Ric Flair's the man. When he says he's a man, he is the man. My hat's off to you, buddy. My greatest respect under you. But you earned my respect. Because at the time, you know, like Ric Flair and uh, Robert got injured when we were doing TV in Rock Hill. Uh, there's a, another little tag team called the Rock and Roll RPMs. Mike Davis and his partner. You know, I want to think of somebody's name, but I can't. But I was working with Mike Davis' partner. Robert got hurt, so we went to TV, so I'm doing a single match. This guy's having a work for brother. I have a single match. Flair's watching it. Because Flair watches everything. See, because he don't know who he's going to work with. And see, that's how smart Flair is. People don't realize that. He watches everybody work. So when he has a match with you, he has a good match with you. See, it's what a good, see a good baby face? See, a heel always has his gimmick. So you can't expect you have a match with a heel and he changes his ways. The baby face has got to be able to tell you. Well, see, being Ric Flair, he's got to work with everybody. He watches everything. He can turn his match into your match. You see? That's what I respect about Ric. You know, he watched everything. He watched everybody work. Give them who you were. Well, he watched me work with the, the rock and roll RPM guy. Brother, we tore the house down. Well, see, it's, I come back. You know, Flair didn't say to me. Dusty came on me and said, hey, Flair wants to do a name with you. He just watched the match on TV. He thinks he can draw some money with you. So, well, you got to understand now, I am the part I am, the world champion. Tag team with the world champion. And Flair's the big champion, so... I guess they go to the drawing boards and uh, we go out and we have, well, no, we had a six man tag. And that Flair is on TV, he's knocking the shit out of me. You know, I, Rock and Roll Express. We, at the time, we've been working with the Four Horsemen too. Uh, oh, yeah, so your matches with the Anderson had happened all before this, right? Yeah, yeah, but see, that, but you gotta understand, he's uh, he's thinking ahead, you know, so we got a match. When it's, it's me, Robert, and Dusty Rhodes against Ole Arn and Flair. My brother, I beat Flair out the fight. Elimination up. match. The elimination match. It's down to me and Flair. Yeah. And Flair puts me over right in the middle of the fucking ring. Well, to him, he done got on TV and talked about, you know, the Martini boppers. I'm just a kid. He's going to beat the blah, 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 blah. See, Flair's smart son bitch, boy. <laughs> goddamn, I beat him in the middle of He can't believe it. Well, he's so goddamn pissed off, he chases me back to the dressing room. And we do the angle where he rubs my face on the gutter. Brother, you did it, dude. I mark my face all up. You got that video? You got... I'm going to search for it. Well, you'll find it. It's, it's one of the best ones. Yeah, yeah. What was good is when I got the kids on it, it's going across the concrete when it's rubbing my head. Mm -hmm. People bought that son of a bitch. Okay? Lord and behold. At the time, Buddy Landale did an angle with Flair, and I know they did like $43,000 in Raleigh, North Carolina. You see, that's unbelievable. What a house. Dusty had a big meeting, you know, telling Flair and Buddy, that's a record that'll be broken. Or did my angle with Flair, uh, Elliot Murdick called, he, he ran Raleigh at the time. He called that Wednesday, told Dusty, it's been Flair's meeting for the first time that Winston Raleigh. He said, it's already sold out. Right. He said, what? He said, yeah, we got the ticket process too. So that brother, I think we did like a $60,000 fucking house. It's Dusty, God damn. Here we go. So, boom. So, uh, a lot of first things with Flair, you know, brother, my face, I'll beat up. Our Broadways every night. We went nine hour Broadways in one week. I mean, Flair, that's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, twice on Saturday, and twice on Sunday. Broadways. What you know? What a what a machine this bastard is, buddy. What a machine Ric Flair is. Don't ever think you blow him up, <laughs> brother. You know, like, like a cat and mouse. That's what it is. Cat and mouse. I'm gonna play with you. He can tell when he's time. You know, cause you gotta understand if he wanted to blow you up, he could. But you gotta draw money with you. And you gotta be in shape, brother. Go to our Broadway. And boom, you know, once I've been going tag team, I, brought, I can hang with him. I, you know, I had that thing to prove, too. You know, but see, I'm different. 
you know, uh, Flair used to get on to me about smoking all the time, right? Put that goddamn cigarette out. Blah, 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 I'll blow your ass up tonight. I, you know, all right, Rick, I'll try to hang with you. You know what I'm saying? But he, he respected that because Rick knows, motherfucker, I'm going to hang with him. <laughs> you know, I, I had to, brother. It was like, they with me. Fuck you. I don't give a damn how blown up I was. I wasn't going to let him know it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it, it went on, brother. That's how different it is, you know. And, well, we drew up. We had a, hell of, I had a hell of a run with Flair. Great run. He was, a, to me, he's a gentleman, too. You know? Mm -hmm. Anybody can say what you want to about him. Any of y'all out there can, but uh, as for me, I Rick Flair, you the man, brother. Ooh. <laughs> uh, going back, uh, I, I guess I had missed over all your uh, your matches with the Russians and then with the Andersons and mm -hmm. stuff. Do you have any comments about those? Because you with the Andersons, yeah. man, let me tell you about this, man. You, know, you gotta understand too. Before we get this heavy deep shit, when we first did our angle. See now, O. Anderson, he was the booker of. Georgia Championship wrestling for years. He always he's like Bill Watson first. Always used big guys, and I don't know if Oli remembers this, but I know Harn does. Robert Gibson does. Oli, it wasn't the part that he didn't like me, but he he thought I was in a spot I shouldn't have been. I was too little. I wasn't big enough to be a professional wrestler. Which I was a small guy at the time. You know, being in the position I was in. But you know, we did these angles with the Midnight Express and Russians. We sold out everywhere. He didn't understand why. So now we do our angle with Ole and Arn. What it is to say, so I'm it sold out again. Because it's over. And our f first night we met them was in Hampton, Virginia. Hundred and something thousand dollar house, packed to the goddamn gills. We're made of it. The Andersons go to the ring, boy, below, they play that rock and roll music. God damn it, electrifies the building. God damn, these people are screaming and hollering and getting in the ring, and all these going, God damn. You know, I think he's going to be fucking happy, motherfucker. Boy, I, he looks at me, God damn, I can't believe this house is sold out. Fuck. I mean, he wouldn't put me over for not, fucking nothing. You know, God damn, what can I do? What I got to do? Shit, I'm goddamn golden egg. I don't know what the fuck to do. So uh, I start the match off with Oli. I got him in the corner, you know, I was that far, it made me face, boy, I'm hitting him in the head, boom, 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 he's holding the top of I done hit this motherfucker 478 fucking times, he just rocking his head, back and forth, hit me again, hit me again, every time I hit the people, boom, 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 finally I stopped, I looked at him right dead in the eyes, turned my back to him, walked to the middle of the ring, I took a big old fucking bump. I heard Robert Gibson go, oh, fuck, I heard Arnison go, god damn. <laughs> And I heard all this going, you stupid son of a bitch, what'd you do that for? I went, hell, you didn't go down, I thought I fucking would. <laughs> After that, brother, <laughs> only looked at me and says, you crazy son of a bitch. He said, I don't know whether to whoop your ass or fucking respect you. And he said, I guess I just respect you. He said, slam, and I never, I never seen Ole introduce this moment again. He said, slam me off the top rope. Brother slammed him off the top rope, took my he goes over the top rope, selling, blah, 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 and then... After that, we went into the Rock and Roll Super Summer Solution Tour. I don't know if you remember that or not. Broke every record that can ever be imagined. That's why I chose with Ole and Arn. It's mm -hmm. great, man. Yeah. <laughs> Brother, we boom. And Ole would come to light with it, you know. It's bit, the business was different back then, you gotta understand. You know, Ole had my respect. He used to make me do shit all the time, you know, like, because uh, he knew I was crazy just to do it, you know. You don't come in the ring until you pull that girl's dress up, you know. So, well, I ain't had no goddamn choice to pull her dress up, <laughs> you know. Take a bump on her, <laughs> and, you know, because he did. <laughs> but, you know, I respected Ole, Ole's great booker. After that, you know, uh, I don't know if Ole even remembers that, but you asked Art Anderson or Robert Gibson about it, they'll tell you. <laughs> they damnest thing they ever seen in their lives. If, uh, brother, you wouldn't go down, I thought I would. What the hell? <laughs> you know? Well, you were in a great position back then, because I remember, and, uh, yeah, the, the female fans, they used to give you a gift and faint as you'd walk past. Oh, them, so. well, brother was in that, yeah, that, was in that area of, and it was different, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. The business was different. It's like uh, we did a deal with Hardee's where they opened up these Hardee's restaurants, uh, Hardee's hamburgers in these small towns. Mm -hmm. Like the population would be 10,000. Well, hell, they had 30,000 people show up in that town. Had to close the whole town down. One time we had to go into a limousine. There were so many people. That they'd take us to the next town to a little small airport, 
They put us on a helicopter and fly us in and land us on top of the Hardy's hamburgers because we couldn't get in there. Traffic was backed up for 20 miles. Jeez. And that, that's unreal, isn't it? Yeah. To think of something like that. Yeah. Unreal, man. Wow. That's great. <clears throat> so, so catch us up. Where are we now? You, you had your run. You did the angle with Flair. Yeah. You've done the tag team, so Summer Sizzler tour. Yeah, we did all that right there. And, you know, and heat's come back and forth, you know. A lot of things happen. There's a lot more in between there. We, we, we had a lot of things going on, but, you know, it's like you have to understand, you know, Robert and I were in a position now that we could do a lot, you know. And, I guess Dusty seen that and they tried to put a power play on us. We didn't go for it. And uh, they fired us for it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like me, hell, I left. I'd go other places to work, you know what I'm saying? Right. And, uh, but they got a lot of heat off that, the fans. You know, the fans went crazy. It's writing in the papers. We're not coming back to wrestling. Where's our Rock and Roll Express? We wasn't even a lost and found in the paper, you know? So after a while, Dusty realized that and brought us back. But when he brought us back the second time, it just wasn't the same, right. you know. And uh, the part Robert got hurt, you know, hurt, he's out for a year. So what they got to do with me? And that's where they made us to the York Foundation. You know, I had a little run with. I turned heel on Dustin right. <coughs> because Dusty knew when I came back that I could work, and he wanted his boy to learn the best way. And you know, it's like Dustin. <laughs> I tell you know, Dustin used to live with me, and uh, we was working in Memphis Territory, and we was working at, in Pikeville, Kentucky, independent show, and Dustin was there last week, and I was talking, <laughs> he says, God damn boys, don't go live with Ricky Morton. He said, I'm different, I'm old country boy. <coughs> Believe it or not, he said, man, I work with him, I live with him, but he's up at 7 o'clock in the morning, and you're up too. You're bush hogging fields, you Building wood on barns, you're building tanks. <laughs> he said, uh, damn, so I, he said I, was, I love you to death, Ricky, but I was glad to get out of your place. <laughs> I was glad to leave. He said, you don't sleep past 7 o'clock here. <laughs> but, you know, he ate every time I did and went to bed every time I did. And, you know, parked my cars, went off where he wanted to. Wasn't no problem. He respected that, though, yeah. you know. Same way anybody else would have done anybody else. You know, he was going to lay up in bed when I'm outside working. Right. <laughs> so what were your impressions of that, York Foundation? Because you were with Tommy. Oh, it was good. Yeah? It got over good. You were, but, you, know, you were already good friends with Tommy Rich by that time, right? Oh, I've known Tommy for years. Yeah. You know, Tommy was, you know, you gotta understand one thing about Tommy Rich, brother. Uh, you look at your baby face today, there wasn't, a, there wasn't a baby face in this world more over than Tommy Rich was. And see, this is how stupid your promoters are. You know. Well, it's a different day, different area. Tommy Rich could be that way again. Tommy Rich, brother, was the hottest baby face ever in professional wrestling. Brother, Tommy Wildfire Rich. But you see, it's a different area, different bookers to them. You know, that's ain't going to work. Oh, yes, it works. I don't give a damn who you are. You're only over if they want you to be over. And you're not over because they don't want you over. Hell, you can take Bad Boy Buck, the little midget. If you want to be the world's heavyweight champion, if the promoter wants that, he can be that. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It don't make a damn. They know that. So, but you know, it's drawing money-wise. To me, there's not another baby face in this country that was ever over as much as Tommy Rich was. Mm -hmm. I don't give a damn. You be a let's uh, go up, go off somewhere with Tommy Rich. You know, go back here to these country hills right here to stop at a store. and go, hey, there's Tommy Rich. Everybody still knows him. and still remembers him. Mm -hmm. You know. He's over too, brother. He was the first, one of the first real foreign baby faces with all that, all that fancy, you know, jackets and stuff. Tommy Rich was the first. Yeah. Now look, everybody's like that. You know, the first with the blonde hair. Uh oh. <laughs> no, the second. <laughs> yeah. Well, he kind of died quickly. He was the he was the biggest baby face, and then he kind of just they just dropped him. Well, see, because it, it was owned by, you know. Uh, Different territories took over TBS. Mm -hmm. Well, see, they wanted their own boys over. See, Tommy was always there, you know, with with the Georgia Championship Wrestling. But, you know, like uh, when Crockett took it over, you know, he took, you know, he moved all them boys out of the way. Right. You know, Crockett, to me, I think Crockett should have brought Tommy Rich back in. But, you know, he, he just wanted to put all new faces on TV. 
I wish it was successful, but you know, it still need after you know all the time he's done for this business, just to throw him out like that. You know right. what I'm saying? He should still be there somewhere mm -hmm. to me. So you finished up with the York Foundation, and then, and then you started going towards the independent work, right back to that. Well, it's another bottle that Bill Watts took over, you know. And he, my contract was running up, and Bill said, won't you just take off for about six months, and then come back, because he, he said, I'm going to re refurbish you. You know, you're better than what you are. But during that six months, <laughs> they fired Bill Watts. You know what, 800 different other bookers took over. Yeah. I never got much chance to go back, mm -hmm. except for one time. You know, that's when Eric Bischoff was running. Yeah. Well, what are your impressions of Eric Bischoff? You. Well, only thing I know is, is that I went to WCW to wrestle, and they said, and I don't make the money these guys make. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's hard, but you work independence. It's hard, especially when you got six children. Trying to make ends meet, and you know, to them, five hundred dollars ain't nothing. To me, five hundred dollars is a lot of money. I was uh, working a, in a post to fly out of Pensacola, Florida, with Robert Gibson. So I asked the office to send my tickets to his place. What's, I asked Robert, my tickets coming in. So I worked there. I spent not right at the airport, but when I got to the line, my ticket was flying out of Atlanta, Georgia. They went down to Pensacola, Florida. So the only way to change that, I had to pay eight hundred dollars. I didn't have eight hundred dollars. You understand what I'm saying? I didn't have eight hundred dollars. I don't make the money you guys make. I didn't have eight hundred dollars. So I called the office. Well, ain't nobody get a hold of. The woman said, "I ain't nothing I can do." Hung up on me. So you know where I make the deal? Well, I didn't show up. But you know that night, Flair didn't show up and Hogan didn't show up. So to make an example out of somebody. Who you gonna pick, Flair Hogan or Ricky Morton? Mm -hmm. And plus, everybody in the office, they're not gonna take the heat. So they put the heat on me. See, Eric Bischoff, he can't hear from me. He only hears what the people right there are telling him. So Eric Bischoff fires my ass. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm the one that's out in the cold. I'm the one that did nothing wrong. And he fires me. And plus, you know, I go back there and, you know, this business is all I know. I don't have a degree and nothing else. You know, I started out in this business. You know, maybe it's my fault I didn't get a great education. But this business is something that I do know. And I think that I have something to offer this business back. But fuck, man, I can't even get a job popping goddamn popcorn for WCW or WWF. You know, I go back for WWF for six months. You know, they don't, they don't give me a chance. They give me this right here, but bubba bum Well, let me, you know, they block you off. Mm -hmm. Well, Guys, I'm just asking for a chance. I'm not asking for nobody else's job. I know a lot about this business, man. You, know, you, you guys know, you, you've been around here. I'm not starving to death. I go to these independent shows. You know, it's like, for instance, last night, we worked an independent show where I took some of these independent workers. You know, and you gotta understand, around here, you know, you got a lot of great independent workers that these guys have never even seen. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I find the few that's out there, and I get them, all right? You know, I like, uh, such as uh, Chris Hamrick, one of the best independent workers there is in the business. There ain't nothing that he, that anybody else can do that he can't do. So it's like him, I'm like, no, you gotta understand, I put my mind together. See, these guys are here, they work house shows year by year, you know what I'm saying? But see, back when I drew money, we did it week by week. But now, we have done it to a situation where I shot an angle last night. The house is packed. But I'm not coming back next week. I'm coming back tonight. And you know what? It's packed again. Because I'm using the old things, what I know in the business. See, and I'm using workers that know how to work. You know, I, uh, I'm using Conad, Chris, uh, Chris Walker. Chris, thank you. I got so much in mind. Chris Walker. Great worker. See what a great body. We need independent shows with these people. Brother, you know, I put knowledge to them, you know. You know, it's, it's just let the people know that you're there, you know, advertisement, working these angles that, that, that when the barks tell you, you know, I watched it on TV the other night. Boy, you tell that's all fake. But 
damn, y'all's match was real tonight. You know, because I go back to the part where, look, the old days, I uh, do my selling. When I get up, I don't do that. I'm going to jerk your head off and shit down your neck tomorrow night. I do my old baby face interview. And just think, they all come back the next night. See, because it's using your head. But you see, like the promoters today, they're not looking at the boys. All they look at is look at the ratings and how much money they're making. You know, they forgot about people like us. You know what I'm saying? That's one thing I say about Eric Bischoff. They forgot about people like us. You know, we dedicated our life to this business. You know, I'm in my 40s now. Yeah, I know. That. I'm getting old. But I, there's nothing else I can do. I mean, don't you think I could be a good road agent? Don't you think that I could help Klondike put the fucking ring up? But no, I get nothing like that. And I'm not sitting there. I'm not begging you for a job. I make it some way. But you put in consideration for me. Because if I was in your position, I'd take care of a lot more other people that helped me get where I'm at. Maybe I didn't help you do nothing. You know, I have to do nothing. And you owe me nothing. But look at some of us out here. This business is all we got. And you people like you, you took it away from us. I'm not, you know, fuck, I just like, you know, I, I, I like to be back there again. But I'm not asking to be the world heavyweight champion. I'm not asking to be a tag team champion. I just want to be a part of something that I love that I dedicated my fucking life to. You know, you sit here and it, it's hard, you know, I almost got tears coming to my eyes right now to think about the time, the effort, the roads we traveled, just, you know, just to be a part of something that you love. And you, and you call and they don't know who the fuck you are, man. You know, that's one thing I like that Flair said on TV, you know, nobody knows the blood, the sweat, the tears it took to get this business the way it is today. And lo and behold, brother, it wasn't like it is today where you, these guys are, I mean, you got people that I ain't even fucking heard of before, man, making $75,000 a year. They want to bring the Rock and Roll Express in and give us $500 a match. But you see, we took it because what else we got to go to, bud? You know, like I'm saying, people ask me, well, man, you made big money one day. My biggest year ever in this business was $145,000. These guys here make that a month. You understand what I'm saying? And plus, dedicating my life to this business, I lost the family. Well, you see, now you know where that $145,000 went to? Went there. I'm still left out in the cold with nothing because I sacrificed that for this business. You know, you, I mean, you think that Vince McMahon or Bruce Pritchard or Jim Ross or all, all of them worried about what Ricky Morton's doing today? No. Because, you see, they got that secure job. You know, you think any of the guys in WCW in the office care about me? No, because they got their secure job. You know, I just wasn't the one that, I guess, didn't kiss enough ass to take it. Because I believed in what we were doing now. And let me tell you, I know a lot about this business. Maybe I might not be there at the big time. But I won't starve to death working independence. I, I do my best. And you can ask a lot of these independent promoters. We take houses from 50 people to 400 people, and to us, that's a lot. We do good, we survive. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's people like, and I ain't saying like, no disrespect, like they're at Bischoff, or nothing. But what about all us guys that tried our damnedest to make this business what it is today for them to have that? And we, and we, we can't even have a crumb off the pie, you see? Yeah. But they are. Yeah. They live in their big fine houses, driving their big nice cars, Drive their Harleys around. Goddamn, I gotta fucking call a buddy up, bar car to go out of town. And believe it or not, I ain't took a Greyhound bus. You know, I'm not ashamed to say it. I'm not ashamed one bit. But, you know, you, a lot of people out there might say they don't like the Rock and Roll Express. Well, brother, you don't know us. You don't know how we suffered, how we sacrificed our life for this business. It don't make a damn to me if you cuss me or not. I always pay a ticket to get in. I, you know, I hate it. So uh, tell me your greatest Ric Flair story. This is a great, this is another good time in my life. I was, I went to Charlotte. Anybody's ever met Ric Flair's wife, but he's a wonderful lady. And I went into Charlotte, North Carolina one night, and it's the time that Whispers was opened up. And I went in there, and, and Lord and behold, if I didn't run into Ric Flair. And this is the time that Robert and I had left uh, Smoky Mountain. We had left uh, NWA. For the party was in there, he said, man, let's go to my boat. 
You know, and Flair's had a little bit to drink. Matter of fact, he's drunk and shit dying to tell the truth. So I said, go to your boat, Ricky. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. He says, no, let's go to my boat. Come on. And I know Ricky's mindset. You got to go. So, Lord and behold, here we go. We go out through here. We go all the way down to South Carolina. And I'll be damned. We'll get down there. I, I said, which one's your boat? I look, brother, his boat's too goddamn big for the lake. I thought it was going on a boat. This summer, it's got a yacht. I mean, it's goddamn five bedrooms, up upstairs, downstairs, and everything. He had to call a guy to get out of bed to come and drive this son of a bitch. You know, he got a skipper or a captain or whatever it is. So, we get out there and start up. It takes 15 minutes to back this bastard up. We get out there and here we go across the lake. Boy, it's just a big son of a bitch. I'm going, my oh, God. And believe me, if I got a boat, brother, you got a boat. He got boat, right? So here we go across that damn thing. So Rick tells me, he goes, come up here, I'm going to show you something, man. I'm going, God damn, we're drunk or hell. We're going to fly the steps through the bedroom, up through the, to the other, come out on top. Then he asks his little room on top, and we're going up this ladder. I forgot what he's going to show me, but we get on top of there, and I'm holding on to a pole. But when I did, Rick reached over to dress up, and he slipped. Brother, this son of a bitch is four stories high. You know what I'm talking about? He hits the side of the boat and I'm watching. He's doing about three car goes. I'm holding on to that pole and went, fuck. Glad that wasn't me. Right? So he's down there. God damn. You know, Rick wears these $3,000 suits, brother. I mean, $18,000 Rolex, fucking shoes, $500 fucking dollars. So I got to go back downstairs. Find his son, Mr. John, a boat, and his wife. And we're going across the ocean. I get down there, I'm drunk and shit, too. I'm telling his wife, I said, Rick fell off the boat. Where? Fuck, I don't know. Back in the motherfucker came. He fell off this motherfucker, right? So we turn this bitch, son of a bitch, around. That captain does. What is that? Cut the fucking motors off. God damn, you can't hear this motherfucker. Cut the motors off. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. Where's he at? Over here. No, he's over there. He's over here. Brother, out there, you can't see your goddamn hand in front of your face. It's so dark. Son of a bitch. So finally, I get this big spotlight here on this motherfucker, and I can't see that motherfucker. He's 100 yards away. You see him out there. I'm going, God damn, he's going to drown. So he turns that boat, we get up here, man. It's like a goddamn cartoon. They have that live seven down. Get it, throw it. Ain't got no rope on that motherfucker. <laughs> you know, so we're taking about 30 fucking feet off. Goddamn. Finally, this big long pole and get him out and drag his ass in here, bro. This motherfucker. He come off off that boat. He got, he's got, he still got his pants on. One fucking sock. No shirt. A goddamn necktie. <laughs> and he looked like a goddamn drowned rat. He come off that son of a bitch. He's drunk. He, he's drunk as hell, right? He's like, he's, Oh, I'm lucky. And his wife looked at him and said, Yeah, you're lucky, you son of a bitch. It didn't fucking drown. <laughs> well, that's the greatest one of the greatest stories I had in my life, man. That's great. Ric Flair, back out there again, man. What a guy, man. What a gentleman. I had great times with him. Funny, he's funny. <laughs> funny man, brother. If you want to have a good time, you know, me for Ric Flair, brother. Okay, and after you left WCW, where'd you head to after that? Uh, at the point there, I went back to uh, Memphis, Tennessee, where I was working for Jerry Lawler. When it was doing the, the thing down there, I was helping myself and Dutch Mantel was doing a little bit of the book there. I was helping Dutch a little bit, working in it. At that time, when I was working there, that's when Jimmy Cornette started smoking Mountain Wrestling up. And we had people like Jimmy Golden, Robert Fuller, Tom Pritchard. And uh, Robert Gibson was there. And uh, when she was running territory, but I was having in Memphis, that's when Jimmy Cornette contacted me and asked me if I'd be, you know, Smoky Mountain was doing all right, asked me if I'd be uh, interested in coming back, you know, coming to Smoky Mountain Wrestling, working for him. So uh, my first night, so, which I did, reunite with Robert Gibson after. A while after you know we've been split, well split up, you know, just have been working together for about yeah, a year. How many years was it since last time you worked with them before you? About a year, yeah. Robert. So uh, we did. Well, I worked 
you know, like independent shows with him where he'd come into Memphis. It wasn't like we, you know, just, he's in his, I was in Memphis, you know, he lived down in Florida. But uh, we did the thing in Smoky Mountain Wrestling where Robert Fuller and Jimmy Golden were partners. And they were the champions. And my first night was in Johnson City. You know, the Rock and Roll Express reunites. Good house. And uh, I guess it was the spark that Jimmy needed for Smoky Mountain. I mean, I put, you know, like pat myself on the back of that. But, you know, Robert and I were established, you know, after all these years. So at least he had a, a established baby face tag team you see to work with. Mm -hmm. And as a while he had, you know, Stan Lane and uh, Tom Pritchard, which he was working in the back and you know, getting ready for us after Robert Fuller and Jimmy Golden, which we had a good run on Robert Fuller and Jimmy Golden. Mm -hmm. They uh they came in over there a thing and got the territory going and then when uh, Jimmy put Stan Lane and Tom Pritchard together as the you know like, sort of like the Midnight Express give it brother, you know, really, really clicked. Yeah. God damn, I mean, when we started going into angles, uh, houses all got to pick it up. Now, don't get me wrong, man, we wasn't doing $100,000 houses, but you know, for what we had to do with, we were doing great. You know, Jimmy's a great booker. Uh, Cornette, you know, he knew how to put things together, how to make it work. He knew from the past of, with, with our history, you know, checking, you know, because he knew how, how, how we draw our money with Stan Lane and Bobby Eaton, which Tom Pritchard, Stepping there was great, you know, Tom Richard had it work, but yeah. real good. That clicked real good back with Cornette with the tennis racket, you know, and here we are on the road again. Mm -hmm. You know, back with the Rock and Roll Express and Midnight Express. And that did real great, you know, just, you know, uh, Stan, after a while, you know, he's, you know, ready to do, I think he got fed up with the territory, you know, coming from Charlotte, North Carolina, I've been on there all the time. So they brought a guy in by the name of, uh, Jimmy Del Rey, and tell you truthfully, which is, you know, I, I told Jimmy Del Rey this too. When I first seen Jimmy Del Rey, they brought him in. I didn't think that he'd be able to fill the shoes. You know, like being in the Night Express, you know, they chase it to the Heavenly Bodies. Mm -hmm. And the Heavenly Bodies, I might have been called the Heavenly Bodies at that time. I don't think Corey called him that, but, you know, putting Jimmy Del Rey in there, here you go, you got a red headed guy with one tooth knocked out. You know, stepping in this space right here, but you know, everybody's wrong in different places. Jimmy, because Jimmy Del Rey stepped right out of there, brother, and they would have struck me. You know, I come to find out, Jimmy Del Rey was a hell of a worker. Yeah. You know, he was great. I, I really didn't know much about Jimmy until I got in the ring with him. You know, it's about in this business, if you really know, you lock up with a guy and tell him if he can work or not. Mm -hmm. Well, hell, I think our first night I locked up with Jimmy Del Rey, I couldn't believe it. You know, boom, here we go. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he took bumps that you, you know, you guys had ran that previous Oh, match. yeah. He he took, I mean, it wasn't only the bumps part, because, you know, just about anybody take a bump. Yeah. Brother know how to work, you know. So that made a lot of difference. So here we go in, into these uh, situations, our matches to it led up to the loser league titles. They were going to WWF. And, it, and it, hell, it was great, you know. It uh, turned out to be, we drew our money, and, you know, we had to, the loser league town in the cage in Pikeville, Kentucky, Bluegrass Brawl. I wish you, you know, loser league town, but you gotta have somebody to take their place. You know, you gotta the hill team, see what's Jimmy's smart right here. He had Al Snow, which you gotta understand, you know, Al Snow. Here comes another guy in that, that follows the same shoes, a great worker. Al Snow is a hell of a worker, a great worker. And then we need another big heel, so they brought in Glenn Jacobs. You know, which, which you see now, despite all these guys are in WWF now. Mm -hmm. You know, there's Glenn Jenkins coming in, you know, the Unabomber. As a, you know, there's Kane that filled in, which at this time it was, it was a good learning process being in Smoky Mountain Rices for a lot of these guys. See, because there they work with people like myself and Robert, but look at them now. You know, they're making millions of dollars in WWF, so, you know, they got something out of it that worked good. You know, we had to run with Al Snow and Glenn Jenkins. And uh, it did real good to the part until the situation occurred, which everybody heard around the corner. You know, it's, at the time it was Tracy Smothers' girlfriend and my, my wife. I know her deal that was really wrong on behalf of, of both sides. Nobody, you know, in situations like that, nobody wins. 
Nobody's right. Mm -hmm. You know, it occurred and coming out of the park. That, you know, if Jimmy Cornette at the time saw fit to let me go, you know. Uh, don't get me wrong, I don't hate Jimmy Cornette for that, you know. I figured it really wasn't my loss, it was his, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, I went to the independent circuit right after that. But no, we, were really, we, we worked with Dottie, I'll tell you this, we worked with the smoke had a good run with, it was Dottie Ron Harris, the Bruce Brothers, yeah. DOA. We uh, taught them guys a lot, they learned a lot from Robert and I. We uh, had good matches with those guys, those guys are great, they're funny guys, I love them. But in the situation that, you know, it, we was having a deal with uh, Smoky Mountain Wrestling versus uh, uh, the yes. Memphis organization. USWA. You yeah, well, it's been so many different names. I forgot. Yeah, USWA. And Brother Ace uh, Pete. Robert and I were doing great business on the Memphis side as heels with my old lady managing us. But we was doing great business. And, but you know, they saw fit Randy Hill did too that I was in. I don't know how they see this, but like I just going back before, I don't hate Jimmy Cornette for this. This is a situation that they thought were right. So uh, I left and I went to the independent circuit and I think I came back for the last three shows at Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And once they did have good houses, that's when Cornette closed it down and went on back to WWF. What did Cornette say to you guys when he finally made the decision to close it down? Because I think it probably shocked a lot of people. Well, you see, I've been running this business long enough to know nothing. I, I didn't say nothing because a lot of the kids in Cornette didn't tell me nothing. But see, I knew because you know, Cornette, when he called me, he said, Ricky, I want you to come back and make these three shows for us. Uh, Thank you for the shows, I believe it was. And, uh, but see, Cornette would have called me. If Cornette would have called and says, I want you to come back to Smoky Mountain Wrestling, I knew you weren't going to close it down. But would you come back and make these three shows for me? You see what I'm saying? Then when I came back, all the shows were up, you know what I'm saying? And plus, I was a mystery partner. Right. And when the people popped big time. And after every night, it wasn't, well, Rick, I need to, we need to come back into the territory. See, so he didn't say that. So I knew in the back of my head that Jimmy was going to close it down. Mm -hmm. But see, none of the other guys knew. Oh, I was all standing around. Boy, Ricky, you're, you're the spark that we needed. And at this time, you know, uh, it wasn't, you know, it's like Tracy's mother's, it wasn't a part that, it was heat, you know what I'm saying? It was just a situation that happened that both of us were wrong. You know, Tracy, one of Tracy's mother's one of my best friends in the world, you know? But what I'm going back to is that I knew my, my side, I couldn't tell these guys. You know, because, you know, they, they was working the territory. You know, I was on my independence run, and, uh, you know, I had, you know, a lot of things established, you know, I, where I go here, go there, go here, go there. Independence didn't have that. But, but something inside me told me that Jimmy's gonna close the territory down. And I couldn't say, hey guys, listen, no, I think Cornette's gonna close it down. But I didn't. And the last night in Cookville, Tennessee, Cornette called me back in the room. When he had that beating, I knew exactly what he was gonna say before he even said it. And he closed it down. So how did that mean go? Well, it's, it was shocked, surprised, I couldn't believe it, you know. He's going to shut it down, but it was a good one. That team was great about that. Uh, Robert turned heel at the time, and Tracy Smothers, a dirty white boy, brought me in as a mystery partner. And so Cornette's managing Tom Pritchard, Robert Gibson, and uh, who was it? Chris Kennedy at the time. I believe I don't think Jimmy J. Ray was there. But. <laughs> We all got the ring in the dust, so we all drove Cornette in the ring. Everybody turned on him and started picking shit out of Jimmy Cornette. That was working, you know what I'm saying? But it was great, it was funny as hell. Because I'm trying to fight Robert, get Robert, they're not on Cornette, and Robert hit Cornette, and people popped. Yeah. It was good. Yeah. Yeah, we got a video of that, yeah. Oh, have you? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. We'll put that in there right here. Okay, that was good. And uh, what are just some of your favorite memories of Smoky Mountain Wrestling? Because that was during a time when there was like no independent shows running successfully, and they, they kind of went against the odds there. And, my favorite memories of Smoky Mountain Wrestling, it brought back the old days to me. Uh, matter of fact, I wish Smoky Mountain was still running right now. Yeah. Uh, I had some of my better times there. You know, small territory, you didn't have that many boys working. But you know, the TVs, they brought some of the guys in. It was just fun there. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we worked like 
Fridays and Saturdays, and uh, some Sundays, do TV every other Monday. Uh, Love TV every month. We did four shows. Favorite memory, it's, it's a lot of memories that we put together, but you know, it's like we were combining and all the boys depended on each other to make money, you see. It was fun. It was the same thing, so we looked out for each other. We took care of each other. We rode up down the road. We had some great memories riding up down the road, you know, uh, doing different things. Uh, I was, truthfully, I wish Smoky Mountain was still going right now. Do, do you think an independent could survive in this, like, particularly the same area that they were running? I mean, with all the, all the stuff you have on TV now? Well, all the stuff on TV right now is what's keeping independence going. Yeah. You see, uh, right now, you know, wrestling's so hot that no matter what, you know, wrestling's a town night. Mm -hmm. It's still wrestling. You see what I'm saying? And then when they get a name, you know, you know, I used to be a big name, you know what I'm saying? But some of these people still remember the Rock and Roll Express, you know what I'm saying? So I do a very good independence. Uh, you know, there's a lot of independent voters out there. So, you know, uh, Chris Kennedy, you know, Greg Price, Slim over in North Carolina. You know, I know a lot of them. Uh, Mike Duggars down in Eastern Tennessee. I work for all these people. You see, in, in our independent states, we're, we're doing very successful with them. You see, what I do is, is at the point that I go in there and I try my damnedest to, you know, go in there and milk them for as much money as I get. I go in there and try to help them. But see, that's what this business is all about. I don't go in there and tell them I need, oh, I need this X amount of dollars. No, I don't do that. I do, I get a guarantee. But see, I make all my money off my gimmicks. You see what I'm saying? I, I make a good living off that. So that way I go in and keep these independents going like these guys going into the hole. Now, now and then, you know, they bring a big name in. Whether, you know, what I like is they bring, well, I got so-so this much. Not. Yeah, but he's not back here for another year. I'm here every week. You know, I'm working four or five times a week, making good money. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm not making like these guys on contract because I have to work for the money. You see what I'm saying? I'm out here digging, busting my ass. But and another point of view is, you know, I'm happy doing this. I'm very happy, you know. I, you know, I miss, like I said earlier, I, you know, it's part about having a piece of the pie, being a part of something that you love. But if you can't be, you got to make the best out of the situation it is. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so I'm happy to say, you know, I work with independents all over, all over the country. You know, I, I mean, I don't get my car. I fly, you know, Texas and wrestle out there for Jake Roberts. I go up to Ohio, work for this statue. I work for Ian Rodden. Over in Indiana, I go up and do some stuff for ECW if I want to. And, you know, and, and it's independent galore around here. Around North Carolina, Virginia, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee. You know, it's somebody running every night. So if you don't work every night, you can't. Mm -hmm. So I do that, you know. And it makes me happy doing that stuff. Well, what would you say to all the people, the aspiring wrestlers, the young up and young, young up and comers that want to get into the business? <laughs> you better know somebody. Know somebody. <laughs> That's all I'll say. You know, the part, you know, you know, the business has changed now. You know, it used to be the guys come in, you know, you didn't have to know how to work, you just money. But now, hell, if you come in and deform, you know, I walk in, who are you? Oh, I'm Ricky Morton. Mm -hmm. Oh, what, what's your potential? You go, I do money here, NWA, you know, what's with Okay, uh, what's your name? Elephant Man. Okay, Elephant Man will give you a million dollars a year. Uh, just go home and be on TV once a week, and Ricky Morton, and we see if we can get you something tonight. That's what it is. Fuck, it's so goddamn different. Hey, you know how good you are. You know, so you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, going back, you team with, uh, you know, you did the Rock and Roll Express all those years. And how was your relationship with uh, Robert Gibson? Robert Hooter Dinner Gibson. <laughs> you know, a lot of people's done a lot of shit in their life. And the ones I liked, I tried twice. Let me tell you that. Robert and I. It's something that you, it's, it's a bond that you or nobody else could ever match. You know, me and Robert's been together longer, I guess, than any tag team in history has ever been together. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been together 17, 18 years. I was with Robert, you know, because we was on the road to work. I was with him when I was my wife. And you got to understand, between these years, you know, Robert's not my brother. Matter of fact, I consider him my family. Even though he's not, I don't look at that. Robert, Robert's my brother. I love him to death. You know, I kill for him. And he killed for me. You know what I'm saying? That's just the way we are. Uh, but you, you gotta understand situations like even when you're with your brother, even with your, when you're with your wife too much, 
you know, you type Tennessee and God damn, you got to get away. Yeah, we had our arguments. It never took come to a situation where we were gonna fight. Well, you know, we had this big time heat arguments, but we knew that you know Robert go his way for a week or two, I'll go my way for a week or two. Then we come back together, it was great. You know, I had a great relationship with Robert Gibson. Uh, I wouldn't change it for nothing. You know, Rock and Roll Express, uh, people would say that there was something, there's, there's a chemistry. You know, a lot of people have asked me before, why don't you get another tag team partner? Or why don't you do this for me? But you gotta understand, Robert and I have been together so long that people expect us together. It's a chemistry there that, that mixes, you know. Robert and I work together with you. We've been together so long, this is no shit. You know, we can go out, especially work these independent matches, brother. You work people that catch their finger in their ass. You know what I'm saying? But we can go out and have a hell of a match with them because Robert knows what I'm gonna do, I don't know what he's gonna do. Or and hell and Robert can work together. Remember we have our own little routine, we work together, kill 15 minutes. You know what I'm saying? I have people laughing, blah blah blah. You know, it's just good chemistry, you know. Uh, we do good, you know, then when we do go into a little areas and, and do work for angles. Like, I'll be in an independent show, and I work in angles, see what I'm saying? And I'm there, and then I bring Robert in, and we always double houses. Mm -hmm. So we made a good way of doing that. You know, and uh, we and Robert have been through a lot together, buddy. We've been through a lot. We had our up, we had our good times, bad times, our sad times, you know, but, but the good times always outweigh the bad times, every time. I had a great, great career with Robert. Okay. And I love him to death. And I'm happy for Robert. Anybody's out there listening, Robert's got a great store in uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Uh, you can get top contact with somebody, they know somebody has a lot of great wrestling stuff out there if anybody wants to contact him. Yeah. You uh, briefly uh, worked for ECW. Talk about how you got into there and, and how that was different than some other areas you worked. Well, you know, it goes back to times, you know, you say ECW Extreme Wrestling, which it is extreme, very extreme. But you know, you have these people that break tables, right? I want you to go back. Matter of fact, you can find this on one of your videos. Uh, back when Robert and I first started the Rock and Roll Spurs, we had this with Randy Savage and Lady Poffo, which are the brothers. Watch that tape. You see me and Randy Savage going through tables 17 years ago. <laughs> so, to me, I mean, what is it? You know, 17 years ago, we did this stuff, you know. Um, it's nothing new for me, extreme, extreme, you know. It's just, the guys are just a little stiff. You know, some of them are in hell. It's like I was on a show one night, these guys are wanting to go to extreme. One guy did a 15, 15 foot high, did a moonsault. Off the sun, got some concrete floor, and got moved. And after the match, he just, over there, holding his knees, and he goes, what you think about that move? I said, right, you all, you my honest opinion? He said, yeah, I said, you all think you're a stupid son of a bitch? You know, they looked at me like I was crazy. I said, you're a dumb fuck. You know, what the hell's, I mean, look at you, you're holding your fucking knees, you can't hardly walk. Look at me, I'm 40-something years old. I look at these other guys, I'm 28, 29, I said, I like the works, run circles around them, still work. You know, hell, I feel like I'm still in my prime, I'm still gonna go. Hey, you don't gotta do all that goofy shit. If you want to learn how to sell, her brother, I can sell an armbar like I'm going to electric chair. I get more out of a goddamn armbar. These guys can't go through fucking 18 tables. So what the fuck does that mean to me? But don't get me wrong, going back to extreme, Paulie Davidson, he's got something great to him. He has got a great territory because he's got guys up there that are crazy. They do crazy stuff. You know, I went up there and did a few shows for him. I, you know, I work hard, brother. I work, they don't tell me anything gets more extreme. I work for FMW in Japan. Hell, I've been there many tours, especially last year. Hell, I've been in barbed wire, fire, bomb, tag, glass matches. The player, when you come out there, look like a goddamn jigsaw puzzle. You know, hell, I was there, they set one jab, and they set this son of a bitch on fire. I mean, you tell me what can get more extreme than that. Uh, yeah, but, but Paul Lee, he's got his own type of wrestling, and I'm proud for Paul for doing this. Yeah, I, I went up and worked a couple shows for him. Uh, as a matter of fact, my seven time rich. Uh, but see, I don't look at the extreme. I look about when I go up there, what's my payoff? You know? And I'm going to say, Paul, he took good care of me. You know, he's asked me to come back many times. But you see, I'm happy in what I'm doing now. You know, if I know if I need a job, I ain't like these other people, I'll just call Paul, he says, Sherry, you got a job. 
Or Chris Kennedy was running. You know, you know, why do you job? Well, sure. You know, you just got to get a thing. Was, to me, I, I never watched wrestling on TV. Hell, I've been doing it all my damn life. So when I go home on Monday night, I don't want to watch wrestling. I don't want to watch football. Mm -hmm. You see, you understand? So people ask me about, what do you think about these extreme matches? Well, it's good. I, mean, I know he's just got a lot of crazy stuff that she's up there. That's all I know. You know, when, uh, when these guys get my age, I want them to be able to walk. Mm -hmm. You see? So, uh, extreme wrestling, you know, good luck to them all. But, you know, uh, I've got six kids i got to feed. So when I go to a match, I work a match. <laughs> so, well, I want to cover this. You know, I've got to say, throughout the years, you know, the, the people out there, you don't understand this, but I picked professional wrestling to be my career. Uh, through the years, I loved it. Maybe if uh, I had to do over to change things, I might be just a little bit better to myself. You know, uh, I know a lot of times I was criticized for doing a, a lot of different things. Even one time, the part about doing drugs. No, I didn't do no more than anybody else did. Just in a lifetime, the life. Just I didn't give a fuck who I done in front of. You know, that was my wrong part. Uh, but now, you know, I, it's nothing I abuse anymore. Still love this business. I just wish that sometimes I can get more out of it than what I put into it. And it's very hard, you know, and, and being in my day and age, you have to depend on what you know to make a living. You know, and uh, I want to tell all people coming up here, if you want to, the way I make my living now is wrestling and, and selling my t-shirts and, and selling my tapes. And once I fix the start, a thing is uh, the Rock and Roll Express's career starting off with mine by myself that you can order these tapes and if you want to, you get in touch with, click on www.hotspot.com. You can see on there where you'll be able to order volume one, volume two, volume three on up. About my early days started out with Nick Goodless, some of the old matches that some of you guys have never seen. Coming up from there, you'll be able to buy your know, t-shirts and pictures. And I know some of you guys out there, which uh, it's up to you, but you got to understand my point of view too. You know, you, when you order these tapes and then you bootleg them and you send them off to somebody else, you see, ain't the point of me getting mad about you doing that. The point is, this is the way I, I make a living. You know, and sometimes you appreciate guys because I wouldn't do nothing trying to take money from you because I don't make the money that these other guys do. I'd appreciate it if, if you guys wouldn't do that because, you know, I got to make a living too. I got six children I got to feed and I don't have nobody to help me. And uh, another thing else, you know, uh, throughout the years, I thank you very much. And you always know that Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson, it ain't the part about being a baby face or saying, you know, hey, we good to the people. No, it's nothing like that. What it's all about is that Robert and I, we love wrestling. And we love the fans that when they come. And I figured out if, if one person comes up to me and tells me, Ricky Morton, that was a good match. That gives me more, it makes me feel better. Complete serenity, you understand what I'm saying? It makes my whole night to know that if just one person out there tells me something like, brother, you work hard, I, I, I feel like I accomplished something. Because I feel it in my matches, and Robert, that we gave you a little bit more. We went to the extreme for the part about seven. I wanted to sell or I cried and, and wanted you people to really believe what I was doing and to make what I was doing because you see, I believe it in my heart. Wrestling is all I know. And if you can help me out with this stuff here, I'm not, I'm not trying to tell you guys, you know, about, about, about this, but you know, when you bootleg these tapes, you know, you're hurting guys like us. You know, we do this to try to make a living and to let you guys see things and enjoy things you do. But other than that, we appreciate it. And if you get a chance to come out and see us, remember, and remember if you want to get in touch with any of this stuff, call www.highspot.com. Appreciate it. Thank you.